now it's about to about to take us live all right and uh it's now streaming live michael and i'm just going to set up the the thumbnail here and then we'll we'll get to talking okay all right that's live get our thumbnail up so people know what they're seeing I even have my guitar, even though you can't really see it in the thing. That's my security blanket. I can still, I can still hear that it sounds good though. <laughs> but that you're just playing it acoustically, right? It's not coming through your. Yeah, yeah, I'm not playing through. <laughs> Is that uh, your, one of your Greg uh, Bach guitars? What's that? Is that one of your Greg guitars? Yes, it is. It's it's my. My most recent one, it's light as a feather, which is one thing I super love about it. And I have those Fluence Fishman pickups. Oh yeah, what's the, what's the word on those? I like them, the Strat ones. I'm actually tempted to try the, the Telly ones. Yeah. Yeah, the, I had seen a really great um, thing with that Greg Koch guy, Koch or whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah. And, um, it was just him into a tether, which is one thing I Yeah. Are we cool? Yeah, yeah, we're good. I, I It just came in for a second uh, where it was double tracking it just because I, I brought up yeah. the, the uh, YouTube side, but now we're- Yeah. So I loved how it sounded and I just sort of took a chance on them and Greg put them in, but they really sound nice. Yeah, it was, it was Greg happy with them too? Who is? Well, was Greg happy with them too? Oh yeah, I think he's got them in like all his guitars and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you had to charge? Because it's a USB charger, right? That it that it uses for those pickups. Yeah, I, you know what? I mean, if I was out touring or something, I'd be more like aware of it. But every now and then, I go, yeah. It's, I had the thing. It's I think it's extra to get that, but it's like a back plate that you literally yeah just plug in the little thing. And you can get 300 hours out of it. So incredible. Yeah. Nice. How would you say it compares to like the the pickups in the in the hit maker there, your your sunburst strat? Um that is glassier. And I kind of like the difference. This has a built-in you pull one of the pots and you get a, like a fixed amount of boost. Right. And it's a nice little amount and the sound is like sort of fuller and stuff. So they really thought out the, um, you know, the amount you get and stuff. Maybe, maybe that was his preference or something, but it's cool. Something about that other booster that's in the hit maker thing, the Kaufman booster with those Fralin singles and stuff. I mean, these are these are hum canceling, so right. uh, they don't sound exactly the same. It doesn't sound as you know the middle and and bridge pickup don't sound as stratty as that, but it's a great sound. Yeah, and uh, before we get into it, I said, I, since we already talked a little bit about the hitmaker, what is that guitar? Because that's usually the one that, like, when I think of some of the some of the old like mt like uh, recordings that i see where you're where you're visible on stage it's either that or like i think it was like a tom anderson or something like that yeah yeah so what, no, that? my tom anderson uh was short-lived i mean i actually still have it it's one of those guitars i painted and i put um those gold foil pickups in it right it's good that was a christmas present that promptly got ripped off out of a studio, out of Westlake studio, like right in the middle, not in the middle of, I was done for the day and left. And it was this thing with Beyonce and fucking camera crews. And, and uh, there were a bunch of people in and out of that studio. And I remember some guy, one of the guys, I thought he was with the video crew or something, came over and was asking me about that guitar. And sure enough, when my cartridge guys picked up my stuff and brought it home, I mean, that was my brand new guitar. I, I'm looking for it right away. Where's my guitar? And, you know, they looked through security footage and like a whole crowd of people left. I mean, so, someone snuck it out of there. But then I had Tom Anderson make me another one, supposedly just like it, but it was never as good as that one. Yeah. 
Oh, and I, you know, the other one, didn't you have a, you had a garage too, didn't you at some point? Yes, that I used quite a lot. Um, uh, yeah. I remember Dave Friedman turned me on to him and, and he made me a, a Strat and, and actually this one, this, this is a performance guitar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Those guys are in the that, family, right? That all through the '80s was my guitar. A couple of different incarnations with different pickups, and then I had a Floyd on it for years. And um, when I got that garage, this was sort of retired for a little bit because I messed around with um, like taking the Floyd off. For some reason, it fell out of favor, not sound wise, but just. And so for those couple of years, some of some of those hits, you know, I had I would use the garage, you know. Yeah. And then, then I got this, uh, I had the Fralins put in the, and that other preamp and stuff. And it, it sort of had the newest incarnation. I mean, that was early nineties, but, um, I paid a guy for this lane. Well, now it looks lame, but this website I had, I paid him with that garage. Oh, really? Well, so then yeah, he and he did his classic garage, you know, that was on all the hits for a website. Yeah, that was on some, you know, th this has been on way more, but yeah. Well, let's let's start back at the at the at sort of like the first sort of pivotal moment. Like, you like, do you feel like there was one particular? Wait, you cut out. How's that? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. All right, good. Yeah, I, I think that for some reason I bumped my my phantom power. Oh. <laughs> now we're back. Um, so was there one particular session that you felt like cemented, you know, kind of you, you felt was was the 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 pivotal sort of turning point where where you really started getting to be the first call guy? Was there like a, a certain point where that you felt like that happened? Or was it like a cumulative thing or kind of how do you feel like what do you feel like was the the demarcation um for you well it, yeah you can almost trace it to it, it took so long to um kind of work my way up to getting those first big time calls that like you know i i mean i i tell people that it took the better part of the 80s for me to quote unquote break in right which isn't to say i was doing nothing and then all of a sudden i was doing everything you know every year got better and every year i made more connections and i would get sessions with the cats you know the guy the busy studio guys every now and then yeah. so it's not like i i hadn't worked with them and stuff but as far as me working my way up to playing on records you know for big artists with a couple of big producers that um that almost seems like there was um the the first big one was was um that i didn't know was going to be big was this gloria stefan uh thing where i got called at the last minute this guy Humber Humber humberto gatica was mixing the song and uh i didn't find out till kind of recently there were already guitars on it um that he didn't dig um, yeah, that yeah. she had done with her guys and stuff. And uh, cause I came in and it was, it was a pretty sparse track. And he said, Hey buddy, I, I want like a u 2 e thing. Right. You know? So I started doing like a, you know, a, whatever that part is just a little thing, but um, it worked. And that was what he wanted. Yeah. But he was sitting there mixing the song and a couple of people from her camp were there and stuff. And um so that was a number one record. And, and I believe that was the first one I played on, but it was kind of fluky. I got called at nine in the morning. Right. And you get in here right away. I'd never worked with Hum before. And, and uh, we ended up working together for 25 years and stuff. But the next one was another sort of last minute fluky-ish kind of thing. Um, this woman from New York named Susan Hamilton, who was a really big jingle person in New York, moved to LA and wanted to get into record producing and stuff. And she had a deal with Michael Bolton uh, to do like one song per hour. Cause she was the one that hired him to, to like sing on these McDonald's commercials and stuff. Before okay. he became big, he sang on a couple of really big jingles. Okay. And so she had like a pact with him that she would get to produce um, I think she did like Georgia on my mind on the album before it or 
anyway, for this record, she was doing, um, you know, When a Man Loves a Woman. Right. And so she was new out here and someone had recommended me and um, and she was kind of like weird over the phone. Another person, I ended up working with her for years and stuff. But when she first called me up, it was, she was like wanting me to sell myself over the phone and stuff. Right. It's like, you know, when a man loves a woman, everyone knows that song. And so, right. so I go into the session and um, Jeff Percaro was on drums, which was fantastic. I had done one thing with him before that. And um, he was just such a beautiful cat. I mean, he treated me from the first time we worked together, like I was like a, an important guy, like one of the cats, like like him and Luke and all those guys. And that meant a lot to me. And and um, I, I remember at that session before we got going, I was talking to Jeff and I said, man, what's up with this Susan Hamilton chick? I said, she was like grilling me and stuff. He, he said, yeah, she did the same thing to me. And I'm like, really to Jeff Porcaro she you know because she knew who the cats were and stuff but but uh but you know that made me feel better about like man even Jeff kind of got a little shit and stuff yeah and so you know we're doing the tune and um I I, I was just thinking about this the other day because I would try until I got like a rig going I, I would try different things I had like a hodgepodge of stuff but what I had on that song was that remember the Alan Holdsworth Rocktron? Oh yeah. Like you plug your speaker into it. Yeah. It was like an early speaker emulator yeah. kind of thing. And yeah. it had some good things about it. I, I remember it was kind of a little finicky with like the level that it saw and stuff like that. But anyway, for that session, I had um a, a marshal into that you know, Marshall and clean, like a plexi or something, right? Right. right. With, with no effects because it was, you know, and I had that, uh, you know, that that opening thing that just worked. And I wasn't even sure, I remember in the tune, I, I did like, something like that, which wasn't even the right part. Like the original was like a high thing like that, you know, but it was kind of cool because I didn't have the, the exact part off the record and stuff. And so Michael dug it and his guitar players ever since have had to learn that that <laughs> part verbatim. Yeah. Uh, was that was that the hitmaker strat there that you were uh, it was it, into that Marshall, into the Holdsworth thing, through like some kind of little rack I had at that time. I, I remember my big piece of gear was the 2290. Oh, nice. And I think about that now and, you know, it's, I guess it's still people are looking for those and stuff, but, oh, yeah. but like, as someone told me, it's like, it's just a mono delay. Yeah. But that was my, I, I remember it was expensive. It was like 1800 bucks and I had to save up for it. And, but it gave me the sense of like, I, I was starting to have like a little rig built around yeah. it, you know, yeah. but it, but it had that mono sort of ping pong, not ping pong, but it was just a mono delay that I would set to go back and forth. Yeah. And it had modulation on it, but I remember thinking it was gonna get me like the edge kind of modulation, but even with the 2290 modulation on full, it was still kind of a light yeah. chorusing and wasn't as, uh, not that what I was after was that extreme of a detuning thing, but it wasn't, what I was looking for. And I didn't get that until the H3000 and the famous yeah. micro pitch shift patch, you know? And so were you using, so at that time with the, I mean, cause that's a really classic. I mean, to me, that's sort of like a really fat organic strat tone that you hear in the opening of, of that, of that song. Yeah. And yeah, so, so on that, yeah. Uh, well on that uh, Michael Bolton song, I mean, that was just, I think it was just dry with uh, nothing on. I don't think I had a choice of like, you know, I, I, I've i always been kind of shy on, on printing reverbs and stuff anyway, but I don't think, I didn't even have any delay or anything on it. Um, and I, geez, I probably had the 2290, but maybe I did, nah, that, well, that was like 1990. No, I had it, but, but anyway, it was, um, that kept me searching for that edge yeah. tune thing. And I felt like I found it with the, um, 
which I, I guess maybe shortly after that I got the three thousand because I've had I, you know that you had it. that was pretty early on. Yeah. What what was the pickups that were in the were in your Strat at that time? Actually, the ones in it for a long time for most of the eighties until until it lay fallow for a couple of years and then I I you know recharged it with with the current setup which is Fralin vintage uh i'm not sure exactly 50s vintage just regular singles that Fralin makes uh, J jim kaufman makes this booster yeah. that for some reason like you put it on in your guitar and i never actually use the boost it's on zero but it's on all the time right that preamp adds a, a glassy sheen to the sound that if you take it away there goes your glass right so it was a combination of a, of a good sounding block of wood that that actually sounded good with a couple of different um things well it was pretty it's been the the fralins and so to your question it was uh seymour classic stacks oh really seymour duncan classic stacks with a bartolini booster Wow. That um, also added a, a shimmer to it. Um, somewhere between like having the Bartolini for all those years and and when I revamped this guitar, I had gotten hip to the uh, the Kaufman booster, right? So that's what I had put in this instead of trying to find that same Bartolini booster and stuff. But it was one of those things that just kind of came together, the classic stacks with the booster. Um, and it because it, it was stratty enough sounding, even though they were stacks, um, and it just worked. Yeah, somebody chimed in in the chat. There was it the Rocktron Juice Extractor? Was yes, the, yeah, the Juice Extractor. That was it, man. Thanks to Nick Johnson for chiming that one in. <laughs> and it, I think it. Um, there were some problems with it. I think maybe they got sued by someone. I'm not sure. And like I said, it was finicky, like to the point of like your amp could catch on fire or something like it but it had eq on it that that's what i liked about it and if you went in like with a clean sound and you weren't like taxing a 100 watt marshall on 10 or something it, it was kind of cool i've messed around with a lot of those uh yeah you know those things yeah i want to get to at the end here i want to get to some of uh, mt's picks for favorite uh favorite devices and pedals and stuff like yeah. that but okay so that was kind of like the 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 90s so so that session was um so i'd had that gloria that that tune that was number one and, and then that when a man loves a woman i think surprised everyone like michael wasn't planning on releasing that as a single but the radio people i remember him telling me about this it's like um i never second guess radio and, <laughs> and like they started playing it and stuff and so I had another, and that was like a really big number one song, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. And so I was sort of on my way a little bit after, you know, a decade of, of like doing every demo and this and that and, and just like wanting so bad to, to get called to, you know, play on records because of me being me and not because they couldn't get Landau or up or something. Um, but the the one that really the, the thing that sealed my future with David Foster, who was for lack of any other, you know, I, you know, to be totally honest, I mean, he was the one that put me on the map and, yeah. and kept me there for a long time. And it wasn't because he liked hanging out with me or I, I got, you know, brought groovy chicken salad sandwiches to the session or something. It's like <laughs> I delivered, you know. And um, and it's funny because I thought if I ever worked with David Foster, um, like he would have every note written out for me or something, but it couldn't have been more opposite. It was like, okay, what do you got? You know, and, and that's what it's all about. It's like, what are you bringing to it? So at Biggie, because I'd worked with him like one year prior to, to this first session with um, Celine was the power of love. And I had done like a quickie last minute thing where someone had recommended me. Um, and so I had made that initial connection, but it wasn't like, wow, I got to really show him what I did. And I mean, he, he liked what I did. It was like a favor for Paul Anka kind of 
demo thing and, and a year went by, but then I got a call. Um, that same guy, Humberto was the engineer and I had worked with him, but I got there and Celine was there with her husband and they put this track up, you know, the power of love. And, and um, it was really a, a, a good one for me because I got to do like four or five guitar parts. And I, I even played like um, doubled the bass with this baritone I had. Um, I remember David saying like the synth didn't have enough point to it, the synth bass. And so I went through the tune and I, um, I guess I can say I played bass on that tune song too. <laughs> I, doubled the, I doubled the bass part and gave it kind of a cool sound that the Barry playing. playing yeah. Thing. But um, yeah, I got to do the clean thing and Humberto's a, a really incredible engineer and stuff. And he was like, I remember we were working with the clean sound and um, I might've started out by going through like my amps and stuff, but you know, for that sound, a lot of the time direct was, was more the thing. Okay. And so it's like, hey, buddy, I, I want it even cleaner or something, you know. And um, and so we went direct with, through my rig, you know, with the H3000 and uh, whatever I had going at that point. But um, and that gave it that real that like the sound I love, too, which I, I've done a lot of direct kind of to this day. I still when you want that sound, I can get it with speakers. But but if you want the really shimmery clean strat thing to me it's, it's kind of got to be direct uh but then you got to like make it so it doesn't sound too direct but anyway so we did that and then then we did the famous uh, with the floyd rose into the last verse or whatever and celine just loved that her her and her husband they called that the slide you know <laughs> call it like a swoop or something but um so the other thing is at the end of that session, um, Humberto made took like 20 minutes and made a mix, you know, and um, a lot of the time at the end of the session, someone will make a rough mix, you know, it, but usually the problem is that there aren't uh, the keeper vocals yet, but Celine had done her keeper vocals, so it had like the killer, well, what you ended up hearing as the record was was already there. So he had that and he took like 20 minutes and the guitars were up in the mix. And then, and so he made them, he made Celine uh, a DAT that they took away from that session of that mix he made with, you know, everyone was jazzed, the right. guitars were up. And what usually happens is they make that mix and then other people get involved or other people make comments and blah, blah, blah. blah. Guitars get pulled down, uh, they add more shit, um, and that groovy mix that everyone was like getting off on at the, the guitar overdub session is a is history, right? But yeah. that particular case was um, him making that dat for them. And then David, um, I didn't know this for a while afterwards, but but he went ahead and put like bells and strings and shit on it and that they didn't dig at all they they dug this sort of it's not rock and roll at all but they like the the guitar sort of yeah and, and stuff and so that dat was um i guess at one point they lost it or couldn't find it and they were in a panic because that was the mix blah 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 and um that's a story she's told you know that then they then they magically found it or whatever. But that that ended up being the record that mix that he made that day, you know. Nice, and that was again the hitmaker strat there. Yeah, and and a couple other. I I would do cranked stuff like when it came time to do the the power chords and the the little. Right. There's a couple of little lines and that thing. I had a guitar that a friend of mine made that had EMG, you know, humbuckers and a Floyd on it. So I would pick up that guitar to do, to do my crank stuff. Right. And, um, and was yeah. that? What's that? I, I go ahead. No, I, I interrupted you. No, I was going to say that, that that song was that was the beginning with David Foster. But I remember, and then he start, then his new sort of renaissance of of because he had the early '80s hits and the Chicago stuff mm -hmm. and Jero and a bunch of stuff. And then I, I never realized it, but he got cold for a few years and couldn't get arrested like in the later eighties. And that's when I met him at the end of that like three year period where he just wasn't getting, you know, 
I don't know um, whether he wasn't just wasn't being offered hits or whatever, but that Celine thing, that power of love thing kicked his career back into gear. And of course it started mine with, with him. And it seemed like every other week for through the nineties, there'd be another song that would become a hit. A lot of them were Diane Warren songs. And it was just a good combo, a Diane Warren song with David producing. And um, those songs, the band was me and him on a synclav. There was an English guy named Simon Franklin that, that was over here for, for the 90s and then he moved back to England. But he had a synclav and he was really good on it and really quick on it because David likes to work like that. And literally the two of them would put the track together like say on a Tuesday and Wednesday, I would come in and put the guitar on it. Then he would do the vocals and uh, bam, that it, it was pretty done. And then sometimes he would have uh, uh, the, the string arranger, Bill Ross do strings if, if that's what it involved and stuff. But, but the actual track would go down like that. And so, you know, no bass player, no drummer, but they, that guy was really good at putting tracks together and and um with kind of like more of an earthy sound than a lot of programmer kind of guys and stuff and uh, and that was the sound of those records that whole string of 90 hits so all the, love them or hate them so like on the the robert redford movie uh what's the celine dion the 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 kind of the thematic song because you love me yeah same, that same format song. there what's that same format on that record yeah yeah, I, I guess after Power of Love, that was the next one. Yeah. And that was a Celine tune. I mean, a, a Diane Warren song. And um, yeah, and it was just, and then it was like all by myself. And um, and then that other one that, um, uh, that, that one that the Japanese group, uh, there was this Japanese group called, um, uh, it wasn't Cadillac, but it was some weird name like that. And, and it was going to be for Japan only. Um, yeah. uh, now I'm spacing on the name. But anyway, that yeah, became the, great. Uh, the one to love you more. To love you more. Yeah. And it had the great violin on it and stuff. And, yeah. and um, that uh, just became a, a worldwide hit. But it, it originally was just supposed to be for Japan and stuff. But anyway, and, and then there was just like a lot of other artists that, that, uh, I mean, like on my hit reel that has all those songs that those are, I was just mostly, you know, I wanted to put the most well-known, but the, there was a bunch of other uh, songs with, with David and during that period and, oh, and yeah. for like yeah. so many, so many different artists, but it was kind of a, a regular thing, you know, like every, every other week it felt like, you know? Yeah. And, and then I got to hear myself on the radio. That was the really cool thing because <laughs> You know, that's a lot of our dream from when you're a kid. And I especially was was enamored with the idea of playing on a song that that like you could hear the guitar part on the radio, you know. And over the years, that became harder and harder to do because songs weren't, you know. Uh... Right. I mean, those great songs in the 60s and stuff all had like a guitar signature thing so it was harder in the in the age of synths and drum machines and stuff to 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 create um you know parts where you could hear the guitar so and it, any of those tunes and and with david it was pretty cool because he didn't you knew he wasn't gonna his whole thing was at the end of the session he wanted to push up your two left and right faders even if i punched in you know, a whole bunch of times picked up this baritone and did the bridge with that, picked up this other guitar and played like three notes in the middle of the thing. At the end of the session, he wanted to have that all on two tracks. Of course, on a bunch of tunes, we we had other tracks for um, like a baritone and acoustics and, and stuff, but he would, um, and I really dug that. That was one of the things I sort of, um, saw how he was working and then you see how other people would work where they just wanted like tons of choices which I to this day I'm not into that I'm into coming up with the part and I may layer a bunch of parts but they're the part that I feel belong on the record yeah. um, some other people 
Uh, I remember doing this Kenny Loggins record where um, he he wanted to keep everything, you know, and he second guessed stuff. And I mean, amazing artists and stuff. But and we got on fine in the studio. But um, that whole like, and then like you know, they're mixing the song, and there's like 199 tracks of of things. And and was it this pass or that pass? And and he'd want to like have a backup. It's like I, I love that part, but let's get another one doing that, you know. And that I'm not into that. But David wasn't into that. He was into. That I remember sounds- sometimes he would. Um, I would come in a lot of the time, and I would have been like at home in my studio messing around with a new pedal or a or a new sound or something, right? And as I'm getting my sound together in his studio, I would play that thing. I mean, it might be a filter into a delay or something like that, but I had like a cool little thing. And um, sometimes he'd go, that's great. We got to figure out how to use that on this song, you know? And so like in the intro of a Josh Groban song or something, you might hear this thing. And that was something I was messing around with. Or other times he'd go, that's really cool, but I'd never use it on this record. I mean, he'd be like straight up. Yeah. And um, the way it would go would be, I'd play one pass through the tune once I got my sound up and, um, and he'd write these really like, like a doctor's writing chart, like, you know, scribble, total scribble. And so I'm there and I'm like trying to, you know, get my thing together and, and trying to learn a song right as they're running the track. <laughs> and he, a lot of times he would hear like one thing I did that he liked, like, a, you know, or something that I did in the middle of the song. And he would leave that. And we would punch our way around that one lick. But he wow. he you know, like one thing he liked and, and that would sort of point me in a direction. And then we'd start at the top and I'd do a little sprinkling in the intro. And then it was a law I could never play in the first verse ever. <laughs> Which I didn't dig that rule because and once I started working with Mutt Lang on that thing, his thing's all about there may be four parts guitar parts on the first verse but they all work like amazingly together but David's thing was it's usually going to be that just the piano on the first verse or something because he's into building a tune which is another thing I feel like by osmosis of sitting next to him working on these songs I um I learned a, a bit about producing and arranging how a track should go so he you know I mean that's kind of like dynamics 101 where you start and you build up but um the B section, the first B section is usually the first place I would enter. Mm. Whether it was a volume swell or a little thingy, that would be, a lot of the time, that would be the first time you, you'd you hear me, other than the intro. Yeah, and it was it, the chorus, and it was like, okay, we I'd play the chorus until I came up with a part, and he'd hear something I did, and go cool what if, what if you did that, and, and but on the other side, we do, you know, we would try something like you know, we're fans of the same stuff, you know, like that, what Al McKay with Earth, Wind and Fire would do or something like that. And, and so, we, you know, it, it was a fun kind of a, a, always a fun sort of learning experience that, that might have withered other people, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, we're, we're just talking about David Foster here, but, but he would have this cutting sense of humor, right? That I'd like to give you an idea, um, and, and he'd say shit, you know, you, you flub up something, he said, okay, now try it without the boxing gloves on, you know, and, or, um, uh, but one, one famous time I've told about was, uh, I came in and, and uh, it was a Diane Warren song, but on first listen, well, I did my usual playing along with, with one pass, right? And, and it, it wasn't like one of her A tunes to me, it sounded like, a, a B tune, right? So it, after I finished just playing it down once, I said, do you think this song's a hit? And he said, not unless you start playing better than that. <laughs> but you have to like just withstand that and keep going ahead because he's not saying it. I mean, it, it could be construed as kind of like a mean vibe, but that was his thing. I never once left without him going, man, you played your ass off. And that's why I got called back, yeah. you know? Like I said, it wasn't it wasn't for the hang. What what was it like working with Babyface? Because he was kind of one of the other producers that you were working with. Yeah, a huge it was um, 
as far as his, you know, uh, demeanor and, and stuff couldn't be more opposite from David, but equally as unbelievably great, you know, uh, David and Babyface were the biggest things in the 90s. And I remember like um, for a few years there, David mostly had studios in, at his house in Malibu, a couple of different houses. But um, for a while there, he was working at this place called The Record Plant, you know. And, um, and Babyface was down the hall working on this um, Waiting to Exhale soundtrack. Yeah, we were all over. It, it's so, it's, it's such a great sound. I mean, it blows oh me mind. God. Yeah. And he wrote all those tunes. Oh my god! And, and yeah. so he, he was there for like a few months while his studio, um, Brandon's Way, was being built. Like he basically had uh, them build him like his own record plant, you know. And um, so he was camped out there. And I remember working with David in in like the first studio on the right when you go in, and Nathan East stopped in to our session to say to say hi and and he said um i said who are you who are you working with and he said i'm working with babyface down the hall and i was like so jealous it was like <laughs> man, even though i was working with david foster it was like you know i wanted to work with babyface you know because i loved his records and and uh um but he had a very you know you find with a lot of these people they have a very like uh closed sort of group of people that they deal with you know and they're only aware of who they're aware of, you know, and, and, and Kenny had his, his, well, he's a guitar player. He was playing on a lot of it, you know, but he wasn't like using the cats on guitar or anything at all, you know? Right. And uh, I mean, he, he, I, I credit him with like single-handedly bringing the acoustic guitar back into pop music when he did. Um, uh, when will I see you again? Yeah. I mean, just the simplest thing, but it was like it caught everyone's imagination, you know? And so anyway, so Nathan, you know, he's, he, and that was, I, I believe that was also for Waiting to Exhale, he was down the hall. So the way this studio was set up, I, they put my speakers, um, I mean, it was soundproof, but like you could walk down the hall and hear my speakers really well, like, you know, through the wall. Mm -hmm. And so Kenny's like, walking by this for I mean we were in there for you know a while I think we were working on actually Celine's album and and um so he's hearing me and I was friends with uh or I had worked with the his engineer this guy named Brad Gilderman um quite a bit with this other guy Ronnie Foster we had worked together a lot but um Brad was was Babyface's engineer and and so Kenny like asked Brad if he would if he like he didn't even personally come down the hall and like introduce himself and say hey man do you want to play in a session he sent Brad down and he came in and he said hey Kenny wants to know if you you know want to come in and play on a tune right and so of course I did and I was like thrilled and um the first tune they put up was this song called count on me this Whitney Houston tune that yeah uh, to my horror it was like full and it didn't need me and it already sounded great when I walked in and that that happened to me a couple of times uh one other time I'll tell you about in a bit but uh you know which is like you're faced with this okay I want to show them what I can do right my groovy stuff that I can do but the song is not calling for that right so I just feel my way around and I'm doing you know some volume swells and then maybe a little you know, a little slidey thing or whatever. And Kenny's like really shy and was standing over by the door to the studio and not saying anything, man, you know, just listening. And um, <laughs> and so you're, you're of, of course, on a first time working with someone, you're really wondering, are they digging this or like, do I suck or what? You know, it's like, um, so he you know i see him nodding a little bit and then um so I, I you know played on that tune and and when i hear it now it's nice it wasn't some big you know part that it really needed or anything but it was my sound that, that was in there and stuff and so after he was like um man uh 
are you available to come in and play play on you know the next thing is like yeah okay what about thursday or whatever and uh yeah and i ended up playing on like seven songs for that record and um and that started like a five i, I think it was about five years of working with him and yeah playing and doing his um dvd going to new york and doing the the live in new york which was such a good um so such a good such a uh, story it, it, awesome. to this day a lot of people dig that dvd just because it was uh it just sounds great but you know what to get that um we rehearsed every day for 30 days wow and the band was you know Ricky yeah, Lawson, and 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 and, and, yeah. And, it, and it was just <laughs> so good but can you imagine um playing we, we had the set down in like a few days right the whole rest of the 30 days was running the set like three times in its entirety every day yeah and and because kenny like a lot of artists they like to over rehearse not over rehearse he especially wasn't super confident as a performer and stuff and so you couldn't run it enough for him right but what ends up happening is like you've been on the road for six months or something. It, it's really tight and it's really, um, it's, you know, so it, 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 cause I remember the place that we played in New York city was looked really cool. Like a real, like it was for MTV, but right. it's a really cool venue, but um, really echoey and really not a tight sound at all. I mean, everything was close mic. So yeah. They ended up doing a great mix, but we had rehearsed it so much that it didn't throw you off the fact that it was, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that was, you were using the Grosh Strat on that one, weren't you? I, yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. And a car, I, the car amp was in the. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, the and like a rack that had my stuff in it. And yeah. I, I forget how I was going and um, from the amp, probably into like a hot plate or something like that. Um, yeah, that was my, that was my rig. And, did and uh, do all the, the, the MD stuff for that, or did somebody else do it? Did who did, did Kenny do the musical direction? No, he had a guy who was his childhood idol, this guy named Bo Watson, who was in a band called, um, uh, wasn't Atlantic star. It was, um, um, midnight star. And Kenny used to go see him, and Bo was like a fantastic, phenomenal. Because uh, Kenny, uh, he was from Cleveland, and so like you know, he'd go to the club and see these guys, and so he idolized this guy. So years later, uh, you know, Bo became his MD. Man, because those are nicest, nicest cat, one of those sort of church cats that could just you know. Oh yeah, well I mean you can tell because there's a super church arrangement of Change the World where it goes into that whole like breakdown. Right. Like, at the end, you know, and then also yep. transitions, um, like into the boys to men stuff that you, that was on that. Yes. Uh, to talk, about end a song, talk about a song evolving. Yeah. But the other thing about rehearsing it for 30 days was, and you had all these great musicians and stuff, they started throwing in like two fives. Yeah. And, and before, before I knew it, man, these songs had like so many extra hits. I mean, they were cool, but yeah. they were like and key modulations because it would modulate up in the key, like on yeah on the world, yeah, like a gospel. And so that just kept getting added on, and, you know, <laughs> and and they were working on a show, so there was stuff being worked into it. And Kenny was actually rehearsing the stuff he was going to say, and, but it, it came off great. Yeah, no, it, it it's uh, it's fantastic, and if it, nobody hasn't, if you haven't heard that 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 uh, live in new york i think it was even dubbed as an unplugged wasn't it <laughs> even though it was it plugged. was yeah and then they then they went wait a second no one was plugged no one was unplugged and so they called it like at the night at at the club or something like yeah. that or something like that but yeah. i remember nathan played a like an acoustic plug in yeah yeah he played like a yamaha acoustic bass yeah to give it the look of unplugged <laughs> and we were sitting down Right. So that sort of had that vibe, but we should have just, you know, but unplugged was the big thing. So that's what we pretended it was. Yeah. And then also, I guess you did some of the Madonna stuff too through Baby Phase too, right? No, I only played on one Madonna song and she was a pain in the ass. <laughs> it was one of those experiences of like. That was, that was live to tell. 
Uh, no, it was uh, called You'll See. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was like a minor hit, or it was a yeah, hit. I remember, I remember that one. Did you play the acoustic on that, too, or was that? No, Dean, Dean, Dean Parks played the acoustic he, on it, and I... Doing all those, like, Tony Braxton kind of, like, Spanish-y, you know, style. Yeah, uh, I mean, the little sort of story on that session was I came in, and, and a lot of the time, uh, a lot of people don't realize that the artist isn't there. Right. Um, and a lot of the time the artist wasn't there for, for a lot of these songs, but the ones, and I can remember them all because it, it had a, you know, it makes an impact when, oh, wow, they, you know, Phil Collins is actually here, you know, like before right. the session even started. And, stuff. and there, there was a number of people that I did get to work with, um, with them there when I was doing the track. And that was always cool. But in her case, um, she was there because it was at her studio. She had a studio called Brooklyn. And um, and it was kind of a tight fit, especially with my rig, which was big. And, you know, there was the board and then there was this couch, but it wasn't very far back. And she was sitting on the couch and all my stuff was there. And so I get in there because I think they had been working on something on the tune right before I got there. And so I didn't even have that warming up period that, I realized after that session is like so important because, you know, don't have someone chiming in their ideas while you're trying to get your sound. You know what I mean? It's like, and that's what happened with that, that session. It's like, I haven't even had a chance to go through the tune and she's sitting literally like on this couch that was right behind me and I could hear her right in my ear and fucking everything I played was like, oh no, don't play there. Oh, oh, I like that. No, no, that, no, don't, no. And I'm hearing that as I'm playing this for the first time. Talk about like groove kill. But I did walk out of there saying to myself, no one can say she doesn't have something to do with every note that goes down on her records. I mean, she's definitely not one of those artists that just shows up and does her vocal right. and stuff, right. but annoyingly so. I think she even apologized and stuff, but I found this one thing that she liked, this tremolo chord, and on the record, that's kind of the one thing you hear from me. Yeah, and yeah. she called it like a desperado chord or something. Hey, I'll I'll take that anytime I can get it. That's that's always better than being white yeah. or them not yeah, using yeah. anything. Yeah. What about the one of the favorite ones I had on Waiting to Exhale was what you did on that on that Brandy song with like the wah. Yeah. Like um, the really cool pads that you have. Yeah, sitting up in my room. Yeah. That whole little section. Even though the bass line was a rip from Sly and the Family Stone, yeah, I mean, yeah. they, they did that on purpose. But that whole little sort of wash thing and then the reverse stuff I did, yeah. I think that was the second song I played on. So after the first one, which I didn't get to do stuff on, I, that's, that's funny because I'm thinking that intro with the wah and the pads and the reverse guitar stuff was my first chance to show Kenny like yeah. all the cool stuff I can do. Oh yeah, those those pads are funky, man. They're they're great. Do you remember what yeah. you and used? That, that was a pretty big hit too. Was that your Buddha Wa, the purple one? It was. Yeah. Which, to this day, I I I I've loved. Uh, I they all actually sound good to me, and I'm not a Wa guy, as I've told you before. When it when I need to do a Wa part, I physically go get it, plug it in, do the part. And then put it back up in my closet. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a, those are some those are some really great uh, pads. I really like the the stuff that you did on on all of Waiting to Exhale was great. And then it's uh, cool that you even listened to that. What the hell were you doing listening to that? Well, uh, you know, my my parents had a pretty eclectic musical taste, you know, and they were listening to all sorts of stuff. And wow, you know, and then Waiting to Exhale, I think, was just you know. Uh, you know, my, I remember my mom and her her girlfriends would go and you know see movies together, and I remember she bought the the CD, and yeah. you know, we drive just listening to you know would be in the car and very. I remember that was that was in the car for like six months, or if you go on a road trip, we would just hear that you know several times. It was kind of before people had a a big sort of Rolodex of of CDs, you know, and in our car, you know, we had a 
uh, 90, you know, early, early to mid nineties, Nissan Maxima. And it was like the first year they had CD players in them and it was like a single disc. So it's kind of like, you couldn't have like six of them in there, you know, and rotate them and stuff like that. They'd stay in there for a while. And a lot of them were those things. Like she had that baby face one, uh, with Kenny G and Mariah Carey that was on there a lot. Uh, it had uh, Boys to Men 2, which a lot of those were babyface songs. Yeah, they were. Uh, man, he just had his finger on the pulse of... And to this day, that production style, I, I, it's just, it's clean, you know? It's good. It's, it's just, you know, he's a real pop song guy. Yeah, it's sort of interesting that, that there was a really stark contrast, though, when almost like you stop hearing babyface, like, all together, like, by the time the late 90s hit. Yeah. And, and he started sort of, because I was still working with him uh, through that period, and um, he started chasing a little bit like what was going on in, like, like he had me make him this whole sample library. Um, and I started out, I was going to do it like, like he wanted a nylon guitar sample library. So I started like, you know, doing like all the chords all over the neck and all this stuff, yeah. right? But I was get I hated it. It drove me crazy. I remember I was making it to eight at uh-huh. and uh, I started throwing in little licks like or, or something, you know, like when I was doing the nylon string stuff and and I threw in a bunch of them and like he had his engineer um he took a long time to do it, but he, he like put it out on a keyboard, all the samples that I had done, right? Mm-hmm. Laid it out in a way for Kenny to use for songwriting, right? And um, he found that what he was using were those licks, you know, those little sort of characteristic lick kind of things. And so he had me do another like really um, kind of, uh, um, well, that was a nylon string. Then I did an electric guitar one with just like a lot of, you know, like Phil's little Cur- Curtis Mayfield stuff, okay. little slidey stuff, little things. And um, again, he had that guy, like he, he took those samples and, and stretched them and did stuff to them and, and laid it out. I think it, it filled up like five keyboards or something <laughs> like that. It, it was a mammoth job that this guy had to do. And um, and he paid me well to do that and stuff, but that was in his phase when he was trying to use samples and and you know from from my take on it, it was like trying to sort of it's like all the rap and and hip hop stuff where they just idolized the hell out of him. He was sort of trying to do like you know it's like the kids dig this stuff, you know, and and I guess he wrote some tunes off of some of those things and stuff, and then he started making records again that that we really liked and stuff, but yeah. I, um, yeah. And it wasn't like we ever had a falling out or something, but yeah. we, had a, we had a nice little sort of run there of, of doing tunes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when you're, when you're telling me about the single note thing, it reminds me of kind of like the stories about Mutt Lang and Def Leppard, you know, where he would record stuff one note at a time. Yeah. Cause you started working with him after that, right? You were working. Yeah. With- and I, and I got to ask him a bunch of my, geeky uh mutt lang you know because he was such a almost like a fictional character there was such a mystique to mutt lang and yeah. man i i tell you like like most of us i poured over those deaf deaf leopard records especially deaf leopard of course the acdc was killer and the cars record was killer and uh everything he touched was killer but the deaf leopard stuff for me the layering, the clean guitars, the the eighth note chunk stuff. I mean, it was just perfect. It was perfect in a in a way that had feeling, which was kind of like it set the bar really high. And that was something that I, I, I mean, I didn't even dare to dream about getting a chance to work with Mutt Lang, you know. And talk about a small work, a small closed in thing. It's like I didn't even know anyone, you know, that had anything to do with him. And then, you know, Dan Huff became his guy that, um, I think Dan Dan did two Shania records with him. And um, I remember Dan telling me he was, because the thing about Mutt is 
um, he works these crazy hours that it's really hard. Like, like when I did the Up album, the Shania album, I did the first, I did a week with him in, in Italy because I was in Italy doing this guy Adriano Celentano's album. And, and it was towards getting towards the, you know, they were having to start mixing and stuff. And he was, um, you know, I guess I might as well tell you, I, uh, I actually had the phone call. It was on my message machine where I got home, hit the message machine. And he's like, hi, my, English, my, well, he's from, he's not from England, but he's from Rhodesia. Actually, it was called Rhodesia back then. Now it's with Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Like, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Yeah, Zimbabwe. But so he's like, hi, Michael, th this is Mutt, uh, Mutt Lang. What? You know, um, I, I wondered if you'd be interested in working on my wife's album with me. Like, mm, let me think, you know. Um, so I actually had that and it was a message machine that had the little tape. Somewhere I have a little mini cassette that has that on it. <laughs> and so, um, so I called him and I told him, well, I'm, I'm leaving to go to Italy to do this record next week. And he said, great, we'll come to you. And, and he was in you know, Switzerland, so they took the train to Italy and we worked in uh, that first week, we worked in kind of just this kind of funky studio. Um, and I remember it was like uh, the beginning of the summer and like the AC wasn't even really cranking <laughs> and stuff. But it was just me and Mutt and his engineer, this guy, Kevin Shirko. And, and um, so uh, at first, like, again, he, there was a couch behind me with Mutt sitting on it, but I'd much rather have had him there than madonna saying no i don't like that you know right in my ear but um he so he'd have one of my guitars and i'd hear him like doing like a or some some little simple part right but i'm working on another part and i'm thinking okay he's playing my next part back there you know and so until he got to know me a little more he was um kind of giving me the the basic part and then I would embellish it and stuff. I, I remember at one point saying, hey, why don't you just play all the guitars on this stuff? He said, I ain't got the grease like you, mate. And, and that's what he called it. And, that, and that's what Dan Huff did. He, he did the grease stuff where it's the sort of upfront guitar that where you got to have that that grease, you know? So so he, he, um, he would, use, because I came in and there was already a bunch of guitars, like sort of the meat and potatoes kind of guitars yeah, already down. And I always suspected that he played guitar on, not on the Def Leppard records, but on Shania's records. And, and um, sure enough, he did. And he never credits himself with guitar. It's only like background vocals or something. But mm -hmm. so there was, there was sort of the, the, um, the building blocks were there as far as those kind of parts. But then it was perfect because I would, um, I would be playing stuff on top of that, you know, which, which could really utilize what I do, you know? Yeah. And so like the, the more he kind of saw me do my thing, the more he kind of let me go, you know, but it, at first he was sort of like feeding me those parts. And, um, and so that was a week and I played, oh, oh so the hours dig this 11 AM to 3 AM. Wow. So the first day is 11 to three and you're sitting on your butt the whole time playing and it's the you show, you know, it's no like, okay, I'm going to take a break for a few hours and, and you gotta, and I was ready for it because Dan had told me and, and um, I was ready for it. I, I was like, I know this guy works insane hours and, and I like to work hard and stuff, but after a while, man, your butt just gets killing you, you know? And so <laughs> You know, and of course I'm wanting to do good and everything. And, and so we're standing out in front of the studio at three in the morning and he says, right, so what time tomorrow morning? And I said, oh man, cause I'm thinking I gotta go to my hotel. I gotta get some sleep. And I said, how about 11? And he said, uh, 11? Oh, okay, okay, 11, right? And the engineer pulls me aside and he goes, thank you, man. If you had left it up to him, he would have said, you know, like, eight in the morning or something <laughs> or nine you know I was like 11 was early for me I mean it's three in the morning you know so so that's what it was it was like so we were in at 11 to 3 11 to 3 11 to 3 you know 
and basically spending all those hours on one song. Wow. So the first day we got a song, second day we got another song. And, you know, and it was like, he never like drummed it into the ground where you just hate the part and you're just sick of playing it. But what he would do, which uh, I did ask him, like, what did you ever do before Pro Tools, you know? And <laughs> with, with, uh, with Def Leppard, they'd be yeah. sitting in the control room with like a tape between them spread out with scissors and literally be cutting up this tape, you know, and stuff. So Pro Tools is perfect for him. And he would do this thing where he would like, if say I was playing the verse part, um, he would just leave it in loop record and do like what felt like five minutes of me playing the verse or maybe three minutes of me playing the verse or something. And, um, and who knows, like whatever the, you know, Something, something like that you're playing and you're throwing in little stuff, right? And he would remember that like 11 times back you had a good chicka and like 17 times back you had a good brang. And then like after I recorded all that, he would take like 15 minutes and make this killer comp of the best stuff you played. Wow. And then you'd move on to like the B section and yeah. work on that for like an hour, you know, or something. Wow. And so it was like you were working and getting stuff done, but it was in a take it, you know, and, and God bless him. He loves guitar parts and stuff. So there's a lot of opportunity as opposed to David who wanted the one guitar part through the tune, you know? Um, so, so it was a sense of accomplishment that you made it to the end when you got there and stuff. But um, it, it was, a it was, that was the tough thing, yeah. the, the hours, and it didn't let up. Um, so, so we did a week. So I did seven tunes, and I, but there were 18 on the album, right? And, I was, and so I immediately started thinking, man, I'd like, like a chance to play on the rest of it. And so he asked me about um, how would you feel about coming to, you know, Switzerland to do some other stuff? I, I, he was leaving there to go to the Bahamas to the studio called Compass Point that um, I worked there a couple of times and stuff. And he didn't want to work in the States. He was really down on the States because he had had this big farm in upstate New York that um, <laughs> like, I don't know the thing, like it had a lake on it and they built a beach or something to the lake and it wasn't, they didn't get permits to do it or something. So the townspeople like rose up against them or something and, and uh, they got slapped with some injunctions or some shit. And so he's like, fuck it, and just moved, right? So he was kind of down on doing anything in the States. I, I don't know what that's about. But so I, I did end up, so he went to, Na, to, not to Nashville, to Compass Point and had the Nashville musicians come out there to do their stuff. And the way he did it with them was like the opposite of me doing, you know, 18 hours of me straight. They would have like a couple of fiddle players, you know, Brent Mason, um, maybe Paul Lime, an acoustic guitar player. Um, and he'd do like a couple of hours with say the fiddle players while the, everyone else was hanging at the pool. Yeah. And then at one in the morning, okay, Brent, we're, we're ready for you. And he'd come in and play on some stuff. And so that was much more of like a, hang until you're called kind of thing and they would do it like that yeah i mean i i hate hanging and waiting at studios that's like my least favorite thing in the world so even though it was hard work i, I would much rather have had it be the way it was for me where i was working the whole time yeah and was all that stuff still in the car amp at that time or had it evolved um I remember like, I, I kind of had the kitchen sink at that point. I had a big rack and I had, um, you know, my standby, the H3000 has been there on every single song I ever played on that one patch. I, I've already said that a bunch of times, but um, I remember I had gotten this head from that guy, um, uh, Top Hat, that, that okay. you know, Top Hat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did. called the Implexador. Okay. And uh, I, I remember I got it right before I left on this trip over there to do all this recording. 
and it, and it sounded good. It sounded really good. But I noticed that like when I did any kind of lead stuff, it got ghost notes like really bad, which in the track you couldn't hear it. And most of the stuff I was using it for on that was the crank stuff, which sounds really good, you know, just martially kind of crank stuff. But I think that was the thing that soured me on that amp. Ultimately, it was like, to me, it was just too much of like, you know, you're holding a high note and you're hearing like, you know, some low note, uh, right? Hosting it kind of thing. I mean, some people like that, I guess. But anyway, so I had that amp and I had, um, oh, the, my trusty car for sure, which also I got to say was on every single clean part I ever did for a good, you know, 10 years that the car slant six feet. Or the, or the, yeah. I still have, I had it cut down to a head. What year did you get it? You think? Um, I think early uh, early nineties. So was that on the Tony Braxton stuff too? Yeah, yeah. It was on everything. It, it's still to me the best. It's like the closest thing to a direct clean sound. Something about the way it's designed. It does, like a lot of Fenders. You know, they sound amazing for clean and stuff, but they have a lot of bottom to them. Something about the car had the perfect amount of not too much bottom, so you could do like a you know a clean strat chord kind of thing and it it had that high fidelity sort of presence that that i only seem to be able to get from direct you know but um so that that's still in my arsenal and and i uh i thank them for you know i, I bought that app i never had any kind of endorsement thing with them but i think it got back to steve carr that i was using his app and stuff yeah. um yeah. no so i had that for sure and that Plexidor thing for like the cranked stuff. I might've had one other kind of thing. Um, I, and I've always sort of had an alternate like direct thing I can do when I want that sound too. Cause that's an actual one of the sounds in your arsenal, you know, yeah. that, that like when nothing else will do you have to actually do that, you know? Yeah. What about like, did you play on on the Tony Braxton record? Did you play the intro on "You're Making Me High"? No, uh, no, no. The, I I played on one of those Exhale songs. I've only and and then I think on "Break My Heart." Yeah, I, I have played on something else, but it's it's not. You can't hear it that well. But there's there's a there's a good <clears throat> clean guitar clean strat part on unbreak my heart you yeah. can hear it in the intro a little bit and then at the end there's even like power chords and stuff that are way back there uh -huh. but uh, i'll never forget coming in again at the record plant and um hearing that song like halfway through the song i i went this is a smash hit no two ways about it it just and and tony's keeper vocals were on there and stuff yeah and so i did i did my usual thing with david you know a clean strat thing through the tune and then we did some beefy and then like i begged him to let me play the nylon part because i was actually um at, you know back in those days playing nylon on on uh not not with the real you know there's a guy named ramon stagnaro who's the best guy in the world at it and after a while, people got hip to like, when you have a nylon part, you got to get him to play it, right? But, but back in those days on like Julio Iglesias and stuff like that, I, I, you know, I mean, I can do some nice little nylon stuff. And so, you know, Unbreak My Heart was so sexy and such a great song. And I'd done my electric guitars and there was a real, like a written, you know, uh, nylon string part. So I begged David to let me play it. And he had Dean booked for the next morning and he wasn't going to unbook him. And yeah. for Dean's sake, I'm glad that, that David, well, he was, you know, he wasn't going to let me play it, but, yeah. um, but I just, I wanted to play it just because I loved the song so much and I wanted to, you know, so, and that's, of course, the nylon is, is the featured instrument on that track, but it's one of those things, you know, um, it's weird. You're talking about the um, isolated tracks. A few years ago, um, that guy Humberto was uh, 
doing some kind of remix of that song and he he sent me the isolated electric guitar tracks for for unbreak my heart oh, it was wow. just something he did it wasn't like on youtube or anything yeah, yeah and i went damn i mean like you wouldn't be able to hear most of it on on the record yeah that much that was one of those tunes that that was really I, i'm in there but but like you know could have been a lot more featured because it, it was all about the nylon and the, the, yeah. other, the sexy pads and stuff but but it was really a good part i kind of dug it you know yeah somebody in the comments asked about let it flow were you on that one i know that there's one that i'm forgetting the title of that uh, that was that on the exhale I think so. It kind of had, it sounded more like a steel string acoustic in the beginning, kind of like definitely amp. Kenny on that. Okay. Um, but any electric stuff on that, I think I did do, because there, there was, well, I mean, you can look on the credits. There was like seven tunes on that. And yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's so many great songs there now, like how, for stuff like that though, like on, I mean, whether it's the baby face stuff or, or the, you know, the pads that you were doing for Brandy or whether it's, you know, the stuff that you were doing for Celine Dion. I mean, you know, you said that you thought you would be coming to these charts that were pretty well developed, but a lot of it, they were just wanting you to do your thing. Like, yeah. how, do, how do you, what is like your mental process look like when you're trying to prepare like our whatever the sketch you know that they have kind of right now, like what is your mental process look like when you're going to start approaching these passes? Well, it seems like 99% of the time, it was that thing I described with David where they put up the track and you start playing. And you just, I mean, I approach, my approach is if this was my song, what would I play? I start there. A lot of the time people have specific ideas and I don't wanna hear their idea. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I figure the, the thing that with my whole career and, and my playing and what I like in music, I mean, I consider myself a pop guitarist. Uh, I love pop music, R&B, rock, pop, the music of the people, right? And so the stuff I tend to like, I found most other people like it too. So that was my starting point. You know, and like I said, with David, I mean, he, he'd hear one thing he liked or a couple of little seeds of an idea or something. And you take it from there and, and you're, you're, you're feeding off the reaction you're getting, you know, if you're seeing people grooving or, but every now and then you, you got like a producer that almost was like, for my way of working, getting in the way of himself by you know, either second guessing or I remember I, I did a tune once with, I mean, you know, Babyface, David Foster and Mutt Lang, uh, Quincy, um, maybe Phil Ramon. I mean, there's like a handful of people that I respect as like producers that th then there's like, other people that I either, and, and there weren't too many of them, but it's either like you just personally didn't get on with them like you, you did with most other people, or you don't like their style of producing and stuff. But, uh, and I'm not saying this to, to bag on the guy, but there's this guy, Walter A. And uh, I was never a huge fan of his, produ to me, he was like a real sterile David Foster wannabe kind of guy that he made All right, looks like we lost MT. I will bring him back in once he uh, once he comes back. <laughs> let me uh, let me see if we can get him back in. Man, some he was just about to drop the dirt, so maybe uh, <laughs> the uh, the producers guild came in and cut the feed. Let's see if I can get him on there.
Hey, I think I just think the, the feed cut. You should still be able to get back in on the same link. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. We'll we'll just hang out. Everything's. Yeah, yeah, let's pick it up where we left off. You're you're. You, you, if I might just ask you to log back in, but you can just use the same uh, link game credentials it'll still work all right all right no sweat bye yeah well since there's um i just talked to mt and he just said his uh he forgot to plug in the computer charger and so the the computer that he was streaming it on went dead so he's just going to go up and grab his uh his uh, charger and then he'll he'll sign back in so i'll bring him in as soon as that happens. Um, but uh, for those of you that are watching, I mean, let's, let's get these questions going. It sounds like he's, he's still ready to go. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep him on for as long as he's willing. So uh, if you have questions for MT, please put them in the, uh, the comments there to the right in the live chat. And I will ask him as many of those as possible. I also want to get him talking about what are some of his favorite pedals for different purposes. So I want to talk to him about like sleeper pedals, you know, pedals that he recommends for drive, modulation, distortion, delay, reverb, um, chorus, and, uh, and detune and all that stuff. So make sure that uh, you get the, any of the questions you want me to ask in addition to, to gear related questions and uh, we'll get it going. He's just going to get his charger plug back in the computer and then he'll log back in and I'll bring him, I'll bring him back on. So should be good. What's been, I don't know how many of you have been watching this the whole time. I mean, we kind of covered the gamut here. We've been talking for already about a little hour and 15 or so. It's been some good highlights with Celine Dion and Babyface and Michael Bolton. All the classics. I appreciate how many people are still watching. This is kind of incredible that they're staying on, <laughs> even though the feed got shut off on Mike's side. Yeah, again, if you're if you're uh, just coming in, Michael had we lost Mike's feed because his uh, computer charger was not plugged in, and so he's grabbing the ch another charger and he's going to sign back in as soon as he gets the computer up and running again. So we'll have him back on in a few minutes. But in the meantime, you're welcome to ask any questions in the live chat section, uh, kind of on the right hand of the screen. And uh, I will ask him as many questions as we can get to um, and uh, in the time that we have. And I'll, I'll spend a little bit of the, the end portion here kind of talking about some of his favorite gear. But I want to kind of have him finish the story. He's about to just drop a, a doozy on, on working with troublesome producers and uh, got cut off. It almost seemed like it was... Uh, <laughs> it was fate intervening so uh yeah at, make sure you ask those questions and i will get to as many as i can um as we sort of finish up here and then again if you missed any of this this will live in perpetuity um on youtube and then we'll also do a uh, another draft because i'm recording here simultaneously through pro tools he's also recording through pro tools so we'll do a podcast uh audio only version that'll come out in probably a, a week or so but um yeah oh derek scott dr scott uh crunch sounds i'll ask about that yeah if you don't have your laptop charger or your phone charger make sure you plug that in before you die <laughs> you don't want to end up like uh mt on the live stream with the computer going down it's an honest mistake that happens to everybody
Yeah, and again, if you're you're just coming in, just Michael's just grabbing his computer charger, getting it fired back up, and then uh, is this going to continue the the stream from there? Brian, also, if he's using a DI out on his Synergy system for recording as well as for live, ended up buying Synergy preamp system in Free the Tone Triavatar Chorus, thanks to him. I will ask him. He had mentioned to me when we, we kind of did a pre-interview yesterday, he had talked about how he was still using the Synergy stuff uh, a lot, and it was kind of reminded him of the old days when he was using the um, Agnator system they kind of had a similar sort of module based um, thing. So that's that's a, something that I, I know he's still using to a degree. Um, so I will ask him more on that as soon as he comes back. Just wanna make sure he's not trying to call me for any reason. Okay, we're good. Uh, Mr. J, I was going to get MXR patch cables, but they were all out. I had to get Ernie Ball patch cables. Are they good? Are they just as good? Well, I don't know which, which are you talking about the ones that kind of exactly resemble the MXR patch cables? Cause there's also like these flat ribbon ones now that are molded, which are a little different. Um, so maybe clarify that. And then Tyler says, thinking about getting one of the buffer pedals you have suggested, will it pair badly with next to a silicon fuzz face? Any buffer will be problematic with the fuzz face. Uh, it doesn't matter whether, you know, what the buffer is or unless you had like something that had this a crazy uh, impedance that, that would be functional with the buffer, but you'd want to put the fuzz before the buffer and then, and then the input buffer could come after that. SD design question for the rig doctor, which scales do you use for blues rock besides the pentatonic blues scale? Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm pretty much just using the, the blues scale. And then if there's, uh, if there's a, 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 based on the chord change, if something needs to outline whatever that is or to show the transition, then I'll just include those notes, but I'm still probably staying pretty much in the pentatonic. I'm just listening for, oh, and MT's calling me again. Hey, I'm, this is Mason calling for MT. I was just returning his call. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so so there should be a um, there should be a link in the email that I sent. Um, can do you, can you pull up the original email? Okay. Is it asking you for a password or anything like that? It there should be like a thing that says like join meeting maybe or. Is it maybe hiding in a window behind it? Okay, let's see. Sure, let's see what happens. Well, is it the same meeting then to say, okay? Okay, yeah, just say yes and see what it does. Okay. 
Okay, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching. Okay. Uh, I, do you see yourself on the screen? And do you see? Okay, you see this you? Uh, all right. Oh, here you are. I see you. Okay, I'm admitting you right now. All right, I'm hanging up. All right. Can you hear? I can hear you, MT. Can you hear me? I can hear okay, you. I'm just turning the Pro Tools back on. Okay, cool. I'll uh, I'll stop mine and turn mine back on too. Is it moving? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna go again. Can we just? Go a second. Back? Yeah, it's recording. I have it. <laughs> Man, I don't think I've ever done anything this long on Pro Tools. It, does it just keep going? Yeah, it just keeps going. Oh, wait, I'm not hearing you. Why am I not hearing you? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, you're good? Yep. Um, so do you, did you continue just running it the whole time, or did you put a stop in it? I uh, I just stopped it when I came okay. back from getting the thing, but I started it up again now. So okay. it could be can, we cool. just do a, can we just do a quick backwards count from three and then just a, and then just a clap? Yeah. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. All right, cool. That'll just just so our, our engineer when they're doing the the podcast side will will not be completely thrown off. <laughs> okay. So so yeah. I I had said in in the I uh, I just stopped it when I came okay. back from getting the thing, but I started it up again now. Okay. So it could be can we just do it, can we just do a quick backwards count from three and oh, then just oh. say oh, sorry I just cut it off. <laughs> All right, okay. we're good. We're good. Uh, well, I, I was saying when you were gone to to the people that were watching, I said, "Hey, this is the the producers guild was was going to cut the feed, you know, because you're about to drop the bombshell." I was, <laughs> and, and you know what? I should learn my lesson to not ever bag on anyone, you know, because it gave me a minute to think about it. Yeah, and uh, I thought, okay, all I was going to do was recount this one session that I remembered where I was like, you know. <clears throat> I was playing down the tune and I got to the chorus and I came up with like my guitar part for the chorus and um, the guy and, and I like doubled it and it sounded good and everything and and um, then he started saying like how about if you try blah 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 how about if you try you know and like it went way away from my original thing and so we did his idea for the chorus and then went did the next verse and got to the end of the song and so I'm at the end of the song and I'm like, you know, not really having fun and stuff and, and uh, thinking I'm done. And he's like, remember the first thing you played on the chorus? And I'm like, yeah, how about, man, how about, if, I, I don't think my idea was as good. You know, I was like, come on, man. <laughs> anyway, that's all that was leading up to. Yeah. And he's a great producer and stuff, but it was just like, it, it was never fun with him. Yeah. Well, for for you, uh, uh, Michael, I want to get into another part of this, which is some of your favorite recommended pieces of equipment that you think are sort of like if somebody wants to go after the the legendary Michael Thompson sound. What are some of the key ingredients that you feel like are are, are important uh, for the sound that you go for, like either in terms of pedals? rack gear stuff like that yeah i mean we've talked a lot about the clean sound which to me that was kind of much more my bread and butter than anything else of course on every song or, or not on every song but on a lot of the songs um like the tunes i, I do here which is 99 percent of my work and has been for quite a while um i'll i'll uh, typically do acoustic guitars because they just fit on so many songs. Then I'll do the clean guitars, which work well. It's like, to me, it's the next thing you put on after the acoustic guitars, right? Then a lot of the time, even when you don't think like power chords, not big heavy metal power chords, but you know, power chords in the in sort of mixed back in the track and stuff, 
they work, they still work great, you know, and so I'll, I'll do those. Then if there's a solo, I'll do that. And uh, then I'll do a pass sometimes of just like um, sort of ethereal textured stuff. That's just sort of like what I do. But all that to say that I live in the, the clean world more than, than anything, you know? Yeah. So that being able to get a great, clean, I mean, we, we always think, or, or I do, and, and a lot of us do think of that clean sound as that, I noticed Paul had his trusty Bartolini, you know, yeah. mahogany strat or whatever. And I, I'll never forget having like, uh, I had the engineer, cause we, we used to play on a lot of stuff together where I'd come in and Paul would have played on it and like getting, you know, getting him to solo his tracks. And it just, man, I mean, it was just perfect. And it was a great sound and it was like compressed. And of course his pocket was, was just flawless and stuff. But, but I would just die over that, man, that sound. And, and so, like I said, I, I initially could only get that sound direct, you know? So I, I had, um, <laughs> I remember you guys uh, on the Paul Jackson thing, we're talking about the tap delay, the ADA tap oh, delay. Yeah, yeah, the SD. I had one of those. Yeah. And I got it because Alan Holdsworth had one. And um, I remember it was kind of an expensive, piece for me especially because I had it in the 80s you know and I, I think it was like $649 or something like that which it was basically a chorus uh, they called it a tap delay so I always thought like it had delays in it but right. yeah it just it, it just went up to a uh yeah he Paul was saying maybe it's 50 milliseconds or something but it had a really good chorus sound but if you put both sides left and right on the chorus it, it it was too phasey and it was weird but like if you just put one side on which was kind of the boss chorus thing just one side warbling it was a really good chorus sound so that i had like three things in this rack that um a dbx 160 a tc um eq mm -hmm. that eq they had the one space yeah which was between the compressor and that, that was my tone shape. That was my amp, right? And then I went into the, the ADA tap delay. And after a while, I got a delay, an actual delay, but I used to have to get the engineer to put up a delay on my sound, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember like most studios had a PCM 70 yeah. And um, early on, I had been doing this album and this great engineer, this guy, Don Murray, put up this patch called Bouncing BPM, right? And it was like, oh, it was just gorgeous, you know? And it was like, gave you left, right delays. And it, I think it had a little verb in the patch and stuff too. So I would request that, you know, when I could. And, um, and so that was my, and, and with the Strat, the important thing was, so this is a big roundabout way to, to say, you gotta get a really good sounding Strat that, that has, like the pickups have to be either single coil or, um, I mean, now they're making a lot of good noiseless pickups that you can get that sound, you know? Yeah. But to me, that, that middle bridge sound almost has to be an honest to God, you know, single coil to get that. And I find that, that having a preamp in in the guitar like i have all these years um it's this guy jim kaufman he doesn't even like advertise that he makes these things because he makes those sunrise pickups for acoustic guitars right uh, but if you ask i think they're 150 bucks or something it's his clean preamp he used to be partners with demeter and uh demeter always made that mid-range yeah. yeah, which I didn't dig because, I mean, it was great for solos and stuff, but the, the cool thing about the Kaufman was that um, it just boosted the signal of the guitar, but it added this glassiness that just, it was like a voodoo factor. But when I hit on that, it was like, whoa, this is something. So anyway, you got to start with the guitar that has the, the good stratty glassy thing going. And then, you know, I'm like a compressor freak and I tell you, man, I can't get it out of one compressor. I, for the longest time now, I've, I've been using two compressors, which like for that really, and, and 
I mix it up. But the ones I currently have are the, um, shit, what is the name of that? Oh, it's called the, the Fat General. Fat General, who makes that? Torpy Effects, okay. it's an English company. Yeah, I know them. And then I found out um, that it's the guy that made those great love tone things with some other guy that they're, okay. they're whatever that is. Which that's a really good quiet compressor that has like a treble, um, a, a treble knob that you can add some really nice highs with that. Uh, but it doesn't. You can make it so it squishes it out. But kind of that on the setting that the blend is like 50 50 That and then man, what I've been putting in front of it is that Analog Man Orange Squeezer, mm -hmm. which I have in a double pedal. Right. It has like a Ross compressor. I think they call it the Bi compressor or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, he he sadly passed away a couple of years ago. This guy Dan Warner um, gave it to me because he was so like he had to learn my parts and stuff a lot for a couple of artists <laughs> he was working with. And and he would speaking of like soloing your tracks, he would get this producer in Miami. This guy um, Rudy Perez that we both worked for to like solo my tracks, and it's like man, how does he get that sound, you know? And and that's always a cool thing when you hear like a really great guy wants to hear your track solo and stuff. Yeah. So um, he gave me that compressor and, and you know, for a lot of years I used it and, and then like live, it would, it would always almost like squash too much and stuff, but there's something about, and I always loved the original um, orange squeezer. I had the one that plugged into your guitar in the early eighties. That was like, man, that thing, because you could use it for like crank that you could just leave it on all the time you know it was it was pretty cool and um so when i really really want the over the top squash thing i'll, I'll put that one on with the other compressor yeah and then if i'm you know so I'll, I'll tailor the part to do with like how much like if you're doing like a you know like a muted funk thing you want a lot of squishy comp you know and, but highs too. That's the thing about a lot of the compressors. They don't, they, they dull it and they don't have that adding the, the, the highs. But I have not tried your Nile. Oh yeah, we need to get you. You threatened to um, let me try one of these days. No, so, no, I'll, I'll, I'll send you one tomorrow. Um, yeah, um, of course I've been interested in that all along and it sounded great in the clips you've done, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so that it's got that Neve mic pre thing in it too, so you can get some cool stuff out of it. Yeah, by, by overdriving it, like I really like it. Like I don't use it as a compressor that often. Yeah, I don't really use compressors too much, and so I kind yeah. of make it so. What I like using it for is like with the Les Paul and kind of doing that Lindsey Buckingham thing, where he would overdrive the. He'd use it like a an LA two A or an eleven seventy six to overdrive a mic pre that was like part of the distortion sound on like rumors and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it sounds really cool for that. Um, but I mean, also just as a compressor, it sounds great. But you know, sometimes compressors can be unusable with um, humbuckers. You know, or it's not as cool. I know. Um, on that tip, uh, this guy, uh, you know, Rocket J Rocket pedals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Chris um, Van Tassel. Chris Van Tassel, just through faith, good old Facebook, we've sort of gone back and forth a little bit. Nice cat. He's he. I bought uh, man. I own like their early stuff that they don't even make anymore. Yeah, I didn't realize they make it anymore. But they made that one called the IQ compressor, right? Yeah. That um, of course, if it's a compressor, I'm interested, right? In the fact that it had the um, the graphic EQ on it. Yeah. I thought, wow, that's good because usually with, especially for live, um, you, you know, I've found that that like you want a compressor and then you, you want to add some highs and stuff with a some kind of EQ unit after it, you know. But so I, I he sent me one of those, and I found that for that, like for for soloing, like like distortion leads and stuff, it's really great um, as a squishy stratty kind of compressor. It's not, it, it almost, um, it's kind of got that Dynacomp type of compression, but it, it really has a lot and you only have the one knob. So just putting a little bit on. And then if you, if you like the frequencies that they have 
on the graphic are more, it seems like it's more suited for distortion. Yeah. And so like all these um, clips I've been doing that melody series. Yeah. They all have that IQ compressed because I'll have my sound up and it'll be pretty singing and I'm getting good sustain. And then I'll put that on and it, and it doesn't sound like you put a compressor on it or something. It just, it's a little smoother and it's got a little sexier sustain. So that wasn't even a purpose I, I set out to, to use that for, you know? What about the milk box? You turned me onto that compressor. That, I know. What is that inside that thing, man? All right. All right. So, so this is cool. I, I figured it By out. By the way, I got to tell the people that you and I, one of these years, will actually make it happen. But we talked about doing a pedal called the MT Clean Machine. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm, I'm still up to doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I gave you that DOD milk box compressor, yeah, which was my compressor. Yeah. It's sitting right. It's sitting right here. Um, many years. So, it, so what it is? It, it it was a collaboration between when uh, Harmon had bought uh, DBX, and Harmon also owns DoD and Digitech, and it, it it is a it is a version of a DBX one hundred and sixty in a really? pedal. It's very similar to it, but they put a lot of squish into it. Well, it, it, you can't make it as subtle as you can make a DBX 160. But, right. But That's what I was thinking. Those are way more, well, they're way more even and stuff. The thing about the milk box, box that I did like is that thing I've been describing where I have to use two compressors. Yeah. It, it had it for that sound, but it almost is like there was a sweet spot with the compression that like, if you put less than that, it's not doing its thing and then you put it and it's like almost too much compression yeah. but then that had that expander thing that you could add highs at that high end yeah it's a pretty cool pedal it is but, but and i always had my settings on it where the release was like halfway up but then like years after using it i i tried putting the release like a real fast uh or not the release the attack like a fast attack and it really like pumps and breathes and not cool. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it was like, but I love that, that it was so over the top. That's why I gave you that. Like if we could have that sort of aspect and then adding like the highs that we were talking about being yeah. able to add in. I yeah. Mean, maybe denial does that, but. I don't know. You'll play, you'll, you'll play it and you can tell me the other one that actually is really close to 160 is the Robert Keeley. What is it? The GC2. Is that the first one? No, no. no it, I have that first one. That was another good squishy one. No, it's it's black and it has kind of red text and black knobs. Huh. And it's very similar to the 160. Yeah. It's a weird thing because like the quieter and the more subtle and the more transparent they make these, a lot of the opto compressors and stuff. It's like that thing we want goes away. Right. It's like, I didn't want it subtle, right. but it's a fine line because if it's raggedy or, you know, noisy or, or stuff, you don't want that either because when you're doing a clean part and it's very naked, you know, you got to like not have a, a noisy compressor doing it. But, but the milk box, the late great milk box, and it was so cheap that I always almost felt like, shouldn't I have a more expensive compressor or stuff? But a couple <laughs> of guys like Dean Parks and stuff started using it because I was using it, you know? Yeah, I yeah. Well, it started to look kind of silly though. The version you gave me is is got regular names for knobs, but then they did one that had like all dairy themed renames for the. Knobs. Oh, the, didn't the one I gave you have that? Because no, no, it says it says like high expand and attack and compress. Oh, and there, but there was a later one that said like cream percentage right and like and curdle like, and stuff. yeah and uh, you know <laughs> like and speaking of that pedal not to go on and on about stuff but i remember with paul yesterday you mentioned my horrible nightmare gig yeah wasn't that the milk box i thought you told me that was the yes it was it was <laughs> and but it was the input to it just the stupid jack Oh, okay and and the, the screen was coming up 10 9 8 and it was the grammys and um, I was down on my knees. And of course, I should have, well, I didn't even know you then, but I, I used to make, and I still do, 
I just throw together my own pedal boards when I need them, right? Which if you have anything serious to do, that is not being a very responsible musician at all, right? But the drag was for five days of rehearsal, it worked fine. And so you move it to the Grammys and they set it out on the stage and you have 10, you know, or we only had like 30 seconds to get out there, get, get set up and I'm getting no sound. Yeah. And so I'm really starting to panic. And the guy said, and in 10, nine, <laughs> and I'm on my knees. And I, so I just start jiggling around shit. All of a sudden, ah, 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 my thing comes on, you know? And um, so I, I got, cause I was one second away from unplugging out of my pedal board and plugging straight in this AC 30 which would have sucked because I had one part of the, it was a medley. It was like, it was, it was actually, it was with the Backstreet Boys and, and, um, and I needed delay for this one part of it. And I needed distortion for this other, but you know, it was something I needed that pedal board, you know? So at the last second, it came roaring on. I think he might've been on like three, yeah. two, what, you know, bam. And so my shit came on and I came home and promptly threw that pedal in the closet <laughs> that might have been the one i gave you <laughs> and did you because yeah, I, I guess you said that you need uh warner he was the one that was doing a lot of those backstreet and, and, and instinct stuff right yeah he he's um florida he's florida guy yeah miami you know your you know your players no he and then he got into producing a lot of latin artists and stuff he was he was a good cat you know and man he just went he was jamming with some guys at a club after a session and he finished the set and just went backstage and keeled over dead. Yeah. And, and he had had no heart trouble before that. And, yeah. you know, so that was, that was a real loss, yeah. but, but that, yeah, that pedal still uh, of the, of the pedals that have tried to recreate the orange squeezer, yeah, that one to me seemed like the real deal because only because I did have a real one back in the day, and that had that it has that same kind of excitement to it, whatever that is. Have you found anything that does an H three thousand in a pedal format for your particular? No, I heard Paul talking about the H nine, which I have never. Um, uh, I, I know they're great. Pete Thorne was saying he can get really close to it and stuff. The the it's it's sort of a subtle thing. But um, I have an Eclipse too, which is my other piece of gear. It's really the two of those things. Um, that when you put up that same micro pitch shift patch on that, and of course, when it comes up, it's just like a, a delay, uh, like a chorus. Right. Plus nine and minus nine, or you can make it plus and minus whatever you want, but it comes up plus and minus nine, which is, uh, I think I just totally like, messing with it tried making longer delays there's a there's a uh thing on it called uh p delay i'm actually looking at it right here yeah it's called p delay pitch delay i guess and you would assume oh it's just gonna be really short because it's it's a just a chorus patch you know but you know so my amazement, it you know, it goes up, it goes up to like six, I think it goes up to 650. And um, then the other thing was that the modulation ate up, it worked out to 30 milliseconds. So you had to, if you're, you know, your delay time is supposed to be 500 milliseconds, you got to set it at 470. Mm. And so I, you know, I got very good at, at minusing oh, 30 man. milliseconds <laughs> but um all that to say that the um uh the eclipse which has like seven times the power that the h3000 and and my h3000 is a dse by the way um which has a lot more cool patches than the se i think was the original one i had but but uh but the original one had that micro pitch shift thing which basically I only use that patch anyway, but um, comparing them side by side, those two patches, one in the Eclipse, one in that. The Eclipse one is, it's like, it's almost too clean and pristine sounding. And not, not that the H3000 is like, you know, 
distorted or gritty or anything, but it has a coarseness, um, a, a little bit of a graininess or something that makes it almost more musical and earthy sounding to me. And I don't know if it's my imagination. I, I have a beat em, and there's definitely a thing to that. So whether the H9 can get that, but most guys are using it on their live pedal boards and stuff. And it's a fantastic box that does a lot of things. But I found with pedals, I personally prefer a pedal, even if it does this one very narrow thing, I'd rather have it do that than, so I'm not, I've never been a big multi effects player, but then again, I haven't been a big, you know, road guy or something too, where you would want a unit that could do, cover those bases. We should compare, you know, when, 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 when we're able to, to, to be in public you know, with other people, I'll, I'll come over and I'll bring the H9 and we can, we can, yeah. we can see how close we can get. Yeah. yeah and I've, I've heard it and it, it's, it's a great box. You know, it's, I'm amazed that my Eventide that I've had since 1992 or whenever, I, I mean, I have had to have it fixed a couple of times, but just the fact that it still works and, and, uh, one thing I found out about it when I had the big rack, they get incredibly hot. Mm. And um, I had like this, um, I have this Moog, uh, this uh, SE1 that actually I fell in love with that sound. I mean, I was in love with that sound back from Stevie Wonder albums and stuff, but, but Babyface had it. That first tune I played with him, uh, it, it actually before waiting to exhale, or maybe that was after, but that, that uh, every time I close my eyes mm -hmm. thing. Um, oh, shoot. I forgot what I was going to say. Senior. So, it, it was something about, something about this Moog device that. Oh, made. yeah. So that tune had this way, way, way kind of sound on it. I'm like, what did you do that with? Right. And he said, well, that's just at Studio Electronics SE1. And, um, it's just mono. So he had like two that like when we did that, uh, that MTV thing that the guy that played yeah. the thing had had two of them so he could do one note. Yada, yada. But I went that day to West LA music and bought an SE one and the Roland synth pickup and the Roland GR whatever to plug it into. Yeah. And I was in business, man. I had that sound and, and, um, Actually, like on a lot of those David Foster records, when you hear that Moog sound, that's me. And, it, and you know, a keyboard player could sound close to it, but I would run it through my guitar rig. So I had my delays and my stuff on it. And, and sometimes I'd even run it through like the, the speakers and stuff. So it would have a different sound. And, and I would use my, my good old, speaking of pieces of gear, another one, the one that's been with me all along is the VB2. The Boss box, yeah. CB2, yeah, which is an amazing pedal. It's like my clutch. You know, my right foot is on my volume pedal and my left foot is on the VB2. When I'm doing the, uh, you know, any kind of atmospheric thing or the volume pedal thing and stuff, because it's so brilliant because you play the chord and you volume it up. And as you're voluming it up, you hit the VB2 and it has that rise factor, so it just comes in on and and vibratos your delays, you know. Right. Um, so which you another another good, funny thing about that pedal was I got it in like um, might have been the late '80s, and never tried it in the latch mode. I just it was either on or off. Right. And I found that it was too seasick sounding to use. It wasn't like a usable. It, it, in fact, like vibrato in general is very hard to, uh, it's a really cool sound, but you, you know, it's, it's hard to use it in a track where it isn't too seasick sounding anymore. So um, I, I was watching Saturday Night Live and I, I forget what band it was, but the guy was stepping forward and stepping down on a pedal and getting a nice waver, right? And, and like this huge light bulb went off and I'm like, that's that pedal I have. And I had taken it out of my rig and stuff. And I remember going down to my studio that night, getting it out, going, oh shit, latch mode. And I, and I put it on that and saw that you step down on it and you get the vibrato and the rest is history. But 
um, that was like a real, it still is part of my, part of my thing. Yeah. And then they, I have the reissue now, which is quieter and um, it's quieter. The other one had a little hiss to it that I guess was on all the time, but I had my volume pedal after it. So you didn't really notice it. But. Do you, how close do you feel like the Wazacraft one sounds to the original? It, it sounds great. It sounds exactly like it. Then, it. then there's like a stronger vibrato that I never used that it's the thing they added to it, you know. So, so you, so you now use the reissue one. Yeah. Okay. I still have my other one, and it still works. But yeah. I remember um, the the only time in my career that I had, like, I never had a Bradshaw. I couldn't afford one. Shit, back in the eighties. Um, Do you remember how much they were back then, approximately? Um, was it? I think it was like you know two or three. It was like three thousand like just to have for the system not for all the stuff in it you know right. I, it was way beyond my scope that's why i started putting together rigs myself and like i told you i got that 2290 and got the ada tap delay and sort of pieced together a little bit of a rig and stuff but in like uh the early 90 well like maybe 94 or something like that i had dave friedman do me a rig a pedal rack the big rack all the wiring um and dave does amazing work and everything not to slag him at all but i i changed things so much that um i start i found myself starting to like undo his like you you know the beautiful like cable work and stuff like that and one time i got to a session I remember Paul saying that yesterday and was getting no sound. It was shortly after I had finally gotten this incredible system from him. I show up, literally was not getting any sound at all. And it was this big, you know, panic and calling him and try this and try that. And it was some stupid MIDI thing or something. But it got me thinking, it's like, when I do my own rigs, I know where every wire is, you know. And, yeah. you know, so... Um, uh, oh, and the other thing about that, and I, and I know I skip around a lot, but the other thing about having the pedal rack was that it was like out of sight, out of mind, you know? I had great pedals on a bunch of different drawers, but like, if I'm not sitting, seeing them at my feet, I forget about them. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, uh, I talked to Tom Bukovac about this, you know, because I've built him a couple of rigs and, and he, you know, and he, he has everything on the floor and he doesn't use any sort of MIDI programming anything like that. It's all everything in series in front, or maybe he has a true bypass looper. But, yeah. But no MIDI. And he, and he said, you know, the hardest thing is, is that when you're in, when you're in the heat of a moment, you know, and at that time he was doing a lot of Dan Huff stuff, you know, where Dan yeah. Huff was producing and then Tom was the player. Right. He can't make adjustments very quickly if he has to see stuff or he has to go into a menu and scroll for stuff. And that's part of the beauty of why he liked the, uh, line six M nine, because you, you, you know, you had sort of the weird effects in there, even though maybe they weren't as good as any individual effect that did vibrato right. or whatever, yeah. but everything had a knob, you know? And so yeah. he could easily get into it quickly, make adjustments, you know, cause time is money on those sessions, you know, and you know, yeah. and anybody. And so he was just like, I needed to have everything right there. I need to be able to turn knobs. I couldn't do stuff with a laptop or an iPad or whatever. It just, it's not, yeah. He's fantastic, by the way. I've really loved these homeschool and things yeah, he's been doing. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I love the part where he's playing, and you know when it, when he starts answering questions and stuff. Maybe I don't see all of them, but um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different. I just had sort of a not a unique thing, but like as far as not needing to be able to like go from this sound to that sound within the the course of tracking a tune yeah uh, which is always really helpful to have i mean any kind of movie date you you pretty much you'd kind of need that and um of course live stuff and um and it just makes it real convenient when you're sitting there to just hit a switch and have it go to that but i guess it's part like i see these things tim pierce in his studio and he has like choice of foreheads and so like mm -hmm. those guys that built that head switcher 
Um, I actually have their their preamp. Um, they're called Kahayan. Yeah, I, I have one of their their head switchers and cap switchers in in our. And the guy was almost like begging me to take this head switcher, but I knew flat out that I would never use it and I wouldn't even hook it up because I have absolutely no use for it, right? Because I actually like to physically go, okay, you know, because I'm working on a part for a while and I'm my guitar into this pedal, into this thing, into this amp. And then, okay, now we're going to do the power guitars. Um, let me try this, let me get this guitar, audition a couple of booster pedals or overdrives. And I've always been kind of like that. It, it sort of gives you the break between sounds and and because I didn't need to go, and, and believe me, there were many times I would have liked to been able to really easily go from one thing to another. And I always made it so for gigs and stuff that I could do that, you know. Um, actually, I was telling you uh, yesterday that for the last couple of years, I've used that Synergy system. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's worked really well. And live, it's been just a pleasure to have like, choice of four different you know the, the two preamps but two different sounds on each one yeah yeah I mean, mo most of the time you don't even need that many sounds but it's been really great and then the way they're um uh i have the stereo one you know the way their stereo effects loop works is yeah. really great and so gear wise i have this i have I, so i have that in my studio um the synergy with a um, pedal board that has a Strymon El Capistan. You know all about my Strymon stuff because I've gotten it through you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a mini vent. Yeah. I have this Free the Tone chorus that's yeah. like a really good tri stereo chorus in a box that these Japanese guys make. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hit you to some new ones too, by the way. What's that? I'm going to hip you to a new tri-stereo chorus pedal. Oh, and I, I got to tell you, I'm not a big tri-stereo chorus guy. I mean, that was Landau's thing. I, I would actually, I use that, um, that even tied patch, even though it was delays, it had the detune thing. Right. Instead of chorusing a lot of the time, you know, um, but I mean, and maybe because it was Mike's thing so much, I never pursued it. I actually had, a friend of mine, this sax player had one and I saw it in his studio, one of the original ones with the lamp cord out of it. Yeah. And I, I brought it and tried to work it into my rig and I didn't dig it, you know? But anyway, the free of the tone pedal for like stepping on a stereo chorus that's right. really stereo and right. really has a, I have that. And then I have the Strymon Dig, D-I-G. Brilliant delay, love that. Yeah. Well, you know all about it cause you got me that one too. And then, uh, then I go into the big sky. Yeah. And so that's like a, a separate path, you know, it's like, I'm going to, and, and I use the, um, you know, a couple of these synergy, uh, their, their basement modules really good. The, the deluxe one's really good. The plexi is great. The 800 is fantastic. Um, into their power amp there that, uh, I think Steve Bryant designed it. Yeah. The class B one. Yeah, it's a one space that's 50 yeah, watts yeah. a side. The gigs I've done with that, I I don't think I've ever been happier with my sound. Because before I was trying to use different multiple amp heads and, switch, you know, stepping on a pedal to try and get all my distortion. You know, we talked about it a lot. It was like, okay, I got to get a good distortion sound into a clean amp, which, yeah. um, you know, you, some of your pedals do it. Um, there's a couple I discovered along the way that do that, which, you know, there's a lot to be said for that when you have backline and yeah. you have a deluxe or something, you want to be able to get a fully realized crank sound. Yeah. But it's so, to me, it's so much cooler to actually switch to another module. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, you have, you have real, I, I mean, I, I, I don't remember. I think that they're too, I mean, their tubes are running at, you know, real amp voltage. I'm pretty sure it was like 250 volts, you know, something like that on the 12 AX7. Yeah. And, and since you have like, like if I'm going from a clean thing on their basement or the deluxe module, and then you go to like a Plexi or an 800 thing, you can get a, you know, have one, one of the, um, you know, you get the two, the two uh, things you can have one set with 
you know, some good rock grit, but not the full on lead thing and then have the other. It, so that's been really uh, a nice thing. I've done a bunch of these tours going to uh, Asia with, with Nathan. And um, oh, one thing it, I found what works great is you request, um, in my case, two, because I was in stereo, two DeVilles. Can you just go into the return of both of them or what? What's that? You just go into the return of both of them for the yes. past. Yeah. It's so great because it's new power amp. you can get them everywhere and they got the power amp. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like one spot. Of course, I'm too loud. Right. So we end up turning my amps around. Right. And like when we go to this one place that like the Blue Note in, in Japan, they end up building a like a whole fucking fort around my plan. It's not like I'm blasting rock and roll the whole thing, but you know, on the on a quiet stage, it's like. Right. And but I dig still going through the amp, and um, it's funny because um, you know I I don't even have a desire to try a Kemper. They sound great, mostly for distortion. I still haven't heard the killer glassy clean thing where I just go, dude, that was the Kemper. They're all like distorted sounds that I've heard or, or that type of thing. Yeah. I've actually heard on the Axe effect, I've heard a, a couple of um, Axe effects, yeah. uh, a couple of sort of clean things that were really nice where I uh, actually this Italian friend, Facebook friend of mine put a clip up and I'm like, damn, that's good. He had like a sustainy clean sound. And I'm like, dude, what do you use for that? And it, that was an Axe effects, nice. but I haven't personally tried them. And the Kemper thing, I just, I don't have any desire to like, it sounds just like the tube amp, but it's digital. You know, why do I need that? I mean, I totally get the, you know, the 12 pound thing that you throw in the back seat of your car and stuff, totally get all that stuff. But I'm in my little, you know, laboratory here and I don't have to do that. I have a mic speaker cabinet and I have my direct stuff but I know I'm getting long-winded here, but in this this um, quarantine shutdown thing, I rediscovered a piece of gear that I already had, this Fryette. It's called the Valvulator GPDI. And um, I got it a few years ago from him when I was, I was actually out at his place to get his power amp, the mono power amp. Mm -hmm. um, actually, when I got the Synergy, um, the first one, I had the mono Synergy thing. I bought it. And then the Synergy guys found out I was using it. I put a clip on Facebook and someone was like, dude, what are you playing through? And I said, oh, it's a Synergy thing. And, and Prashant got in touch with me, you know? Oh, okay, yeah. So they got me the stereo one. That's when I expanded it to stereo. But um, uh, anyway, so... Uh, Shit, I lost my train. Oh, so when I was out at Steve's, um, uh, he had I got the power amp, and then he showed me the 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 GPDI, and it looked interesting and stuff. So I bought it, and um, and and did a few things with it at home, and it sounded good. But I was into, I think I was into like amps and and uh, you know the synergy thing and and stuff, and I never really delved too deeply into it, and so just breaking it out again and it was up on my you know pile of gear that I have up on my wall you know and I took it down at the beginning of this quarantine thing I'm like, let me check this thing out man it's brilliant brilliant mm -hmm. all these um melodies I've been doing they're they're on YouTube and on yeah. Facebook and stuff have all been with that mm. you know and I experiment with different guitars and like I was saying like that compressor on some of those Sistini right. leads it's on that and stuff but I found it's really easy to tailor a sound mm -hmm. and I didn't even I don't think I ever even tried to get the glassy clean sound out of it gets that great you get you gotta work with it a little bit but um that box for direct it's it's like I would use that any day over any kind of Kemper or anything else because it's tube, it's voiced, just great. I mean, I've, I've messed around with a lot of direct kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the Palmers and stuff like that, you're kind of stuck with the one sound. Right. But the, the cool thing about the, the Fryette thing is that the way he's got the, um, 
I think it's called like, you know, body and focus or basically bass and treble. But the way that's voiced, you can really, depending on the guitar and the, and the, um, the pickup and how fat you want it or how thin you want it and stuff, it's really usable. Yeah. And a good sounding, like really active treble bass and middle and stuff. Anyway, I'm plugging his thing just because no, I, please, it keeps man. blowing my mind that and, and the tunes I've worked on, you know, that I'm working on in my studio for other people and stuff. I don't even I haven't even bothered putting any other amps up. Yeah, no, his stuff is great. In fact, for I just put out a video. I don't know if you saw this one, the one where I was using the Helix in the wet, dry, wet system. No, I didn't see that one. I saw it advertised. I didn't. Yeah. So, so on that one, I, I use, um, lately in, in here, um, I've been using this Paul Rivera concert from the eighties, a really? 60 watt head, you know, just wow. the channel. And, uh, and then I go out of that into the, the power load, Oh, which is the Fryat load box. Yeah. How is that? It's really good. And, and, you know, I mean, I have a lot of load box. I have that one and I have the, the, uh, boss was a, tube amp expander and i have the aux box and i have um, those three i i haven't tried the aux or the boss but they I'll, look I'll, I'll bring them i'll bring them over when we do this this h9 shootout yeah and, and uh and i and honestly you know i mean i'm pretty calibrated to a g1265 which is usually the speaker that i use in most of my fender and marshall amps that i have right. Um, and, and it, I can re get really, really close to that. And I used the, the Kahayan, uh, speaker selector to go through the two of them. And, and, you know, usually in our, in our studio, I use, a um, a blue, uh, Encore 100 I, which I think is one of the sleeper, uh, microphone for guitar stuff. It, it to me, it has a really good sort of balance of a fifty-seven and a Royal. Yeah, I think I have that, and it's it, cheap. It, You're like a hundred bucks. Yeah, I have that. It's good. I noticed it was really good for clean stuff. Yeah, so I use two of them in two different positions, typically um, relative to the cone, and then I'll you know. I'll use that. And, and so anyway, I was comparing that to this and, it, and, it, and I could get really, really close and just the setup's easy. If I'm recording, you know, video stuff at home, it's just easier for me to deal with it and sync it and not have to like spend a lot of time with mic placement and stuff like that. And I've been really impressed with it. I thought it sounded the best and, and it's, and it's fully analog um, and all that stuff. So I've been really impressed. And I saw that he's coming out with another one. That's the same thing. And then you can add in uh, impulse responses to that. So you can uh -huh. do the adjustments and then you can go into um, s some additional sort of uh, manipulation of the kind of the artifacts of the speakers, yeah. like that. Well, um, you have the best of both worlds with the miking thing, which I, I like about my scene here too, because <clears throat> you have your choice. Yeah. But I've noticed once your ear starts hearing the direct thing, it's it's very hard to go from that. Like you're better off starting with the speaker and staying with the speaker, because once your ear hears that direct, the the speakers never like. Uh, you know right there enough yeah yeah it's a, it's but, a, but the the, uh, the valve valvulator thing is uh, i'm gonna check just, it out it's really good for shaping um a, a lot of different sounds you know like whether you want like a slightly uh overdriven telly kind of thing i mean i've found it really easy to dial in and i mean i sound like i'm an ad for it but the the, the weird thing was that i had it all those for like yeah. maybe four or five years man yeah have you seen these things, Michael, the, the cab Zeus from GFI? No. Yeah. So this is like, this is basically like has their, they've generated, you know, maybe 20 different speakers in it and, 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 in in mics. So you can, you know, you can, you has a left and a right in stereo. So you can, so you have to have your load still. Yeah. And, uh, you can go into this. And so I've also, I was just trying it today where I was using the, 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 the load from the, uh, the Fryette. Yeah. And then using this to to basically add in the impulse response, essentially after it. Is it's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, I only messed with a couple, and I was just kind of I was only using it to receive the the wet of the wet dry wet. Oh. And, and so you know, typically in the old days, that was would be you know vintage thirties or something like that that would be close mic with fifty seven. So I just like you know put the mic you know really just close mic took away any of the room sound and it just to, just to hear what it sounded like with vintage 30s and a 112 uh, yeah. 
model. And wow. it's been fine for that. Uh, but yeah. I'm going to the more tomorrow and, and, and see what it sounds like if I run the full wet, dry, wet, because I have this one and then I have a, a mono one that I'm going to be building some boards with and then doing some giveaways. But I was impressed just initially about if you actually wanted to do an ampless version of a wet, dry, wet, you could use that. Yeah. To, now, to you know, you say wet, dry, wet. I, I guess I never had, I was never really set up. You sort of do it though, because your stuff is coming between the the. Well, I would have a dry amp that was mic. Yeah, but then, but then, and you were taking that mic, and you were what, going into a mic pre that would then feed the the rack. Yeah, but it all came out of a mixer. Right, and that's fine. So I was mixing that's... in my dry. Yeah, that. But so you were taking it's the same thing, I guess. Yeah, you, except you just weren't going into cabinets. You were going into right. the mixer, but that's the same thing. I mean, that's what I did with this. I was just taking this and going straight into the DMP. Yeah, I, was, oh, I, do. I yeah. didn't have any uh, wet cabinets in the room, and I don't even have a wet cabinet, right? I mean, I wasn't using a wet cabinet for my Rivera head. That was going into the uh, Fryette, and then and then the line out of that was going line into the Apollo. So that was yeah. channel one on my mixer. And right. then the left, and then I went through my, my lexicon and all that stuff. And then that was going in wet left, wet right on this guy. There's also a speaker through on it as well if I did want to go, or there's a through if I did want to go to a powered monitor, if I wanted to go to a power amp, but I, I was cool. just going straight in. Yeah. Manipulate it. So it's, yeah, so you were you were doing it. <laughs> and, and that's how I'm doing it on here uh, on my rack when I'm not using this is I have a, a, I have a mic pre that, that I've kind of modified uh, so that I can, I can run the, it has a tube and it's sort of like a modified Chandler. So, oh. but I'm running the tube at 250 volts instead of, I don't know, some sort of, I don't remember what it was before, like 24 volts or something like that. So oh. running at a, two, a full 250 and then that feeds the lexicon delays and reverbs um, that are all 100% wet in parallel. And then that feeds, I have a Marshall valve state the one that Landau used to use, the 8008, one, one rack space, 50 watt a channel stereo yeah. power. And then that feeds the monitors. Or I can just go straight uh, XL into the Apollo. Sounds yeah. like you've got it pretty uh, pretty covered. It's it's nice to be able to sit down and have all that at your fingertips. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's like right here by my side. It's like I can start messing with the the concert. And, and you know, I... I, I I should hook up the Kahayan thing so that I could switch between this and, and a few amps. But the reality is, is because we're, it's all pedal centric, having a high gain amp is not really, in, for enjoyment, it's great. But for demoing pedals, it's like, it's not, it's not particularly a, an enticing way to, to showcase a high gain pedal through an amp that already has, you know, a bunch of gear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's one thing I noticed about um, mo mostly doing, you know, these um well working with that fryette thing and doing these these melodies and 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 seeing what works best since i can get the distortion level out of the preamp that i want and, and even with the synergy before that i noticed i've gravitated to boosters a lot more and and haven't had that need for like the the full-on distortion pedal which i do um i remember like that that one you made uh i got like one of the best of my europa sounds oh lot. yeah the dynamic distortion the right dynamic distortion yeah. and i still have all those pedals and i love not the rediscovering them but like going in my closet and, and breaking out a pedal that i know was good to me and and uh and loving that but but something about setting up my sound now it's just it's just boosters, you know? It's like, um, you know, the, those those two exotic ones are great, the little, you know, yeah. super sweet and stuff, but I got the Petty John, yeah. the, the Super Chime thing, what, or the Chime 2 or something, yeah. uh, which is just sort of a nice full-bodied boost. Yeah. Um, then I have this one, this guy, Seafoam Pedals, some guy in Alabama or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's called the lighthouse. Okay, which also, I mean, there's a few different settings on it, but the one setting is just kind of a full. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny how boosts and you know better than anyone all have their own little personality. I mean, I almost don't get it because it's like what it's like a couple of little 
transistors and chips and stuff, but they all, the ones I have all have a different sound. You should try putting your vertex boost in the, in, in the, in the, uh, after the, the preamp. After the preamp. Yeah. Cause that the R's can take internally. It's, uh, it'll it'll take pretty much any any swing it'll do line level or or whatever i think it's plus or minus nine rail to rail which on on the subject of that i gotta say that pedal has done me so well and that's still been part of my live rig where i uh i mean the brilliant thing is being able to use i mean it's a great sound and clean booster as it is but um the expression pedal for your volume pedal is so cool and i've turned a few people on to that like michael oh, yeah. Neal and a couple other people and yeah. they just thank me turn on ricky to that what's ricky, that ricky z you you brought him to the table turn him on to it and and it makes such sense and instead of trying to figure out how you're going to use this big metal volume pedal on your pedal board or off your pedal board and stuff you 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 know you have this little plastic i mean in the case of me i have the boss fb whatever that is you yeah know? And um, it, it's just, that has been a really cool thing. I think that's one of the innovations you have that I think someone's copying that now. There's a, couple, some there's a couple that have done some similar stuff. I mean, there, it, it wasn't like it's, you know, it, it, there wasn't anything that was, that was groundbreaking or anything like that. It was no, just- No, but the fact that you did it and you could use that, like that's your clean boost and your volume pedal. Yeah. And that you can just- have the boost on your pedal board and the volume pedal in your suitcase or whatever yeah. you know yeah um, you know that that's worked so great and i like being able to put the instead of being stuck with the volume pedal on the pedal board you can place the expression pedal wherever you want it which is usually not you don't want to be standing right by your pedal board the whole time how, how do you like those new uh, a3 volume pedals i saw that they made you like a custom uh, i like it a lot um especially because my name is engraved on it <laughs> yeah they so give the, the new fun. one those guys <laughs> gave the, the new one they gave me is really cool now one thing that they they have that that i guess has been on other volume, volume pedals but not as successfully as this is they have the booster the clean booster built into the volume pedal mm -hmm. but when you go to the tuner out you don't lose anything mm -hmm. and it's so easy to try on an ernie ball or any one of those pedals yeah have it without the tuner out and be listening and then plug a jack in the tuner out you hear a little dip in your volume every yeah. time yeah the parallel loading well it, so, active they probably have buffered the uh well the buffer. yeah you got to have it it on but you know what i have it on um a little boost and the boost is nice sounding it's sort of a round just mm -hmm. a nice round clean boost i guess you can crank it up i don't know what it goes up to but i have it on just a little bit but that fat um that thing alone that the because i was having to go from like a pedal that had two outs on it like a, a chorus or uh, different pedals like for my live thing to feed the tuner mm -hmm. Cause I don't like to have to step on the tuner. Right. And I don't like the, the, I've done it where you put it on the, the headstock. That's goofy as hell. And another thing I found out is when you're on a stage playing with like a bass player and stuff, those things don't want to read. Right. Cause they're picking up so many vibrations. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so to not have to have a pedal just to feed the tuner, it's, it's pretty cool to have that built into, um, I, in fact, I was going to ask you, I guess, I guess there'd be a way to do that on the clean boost, right? Just another out. Well, you could, if you weren't going to connect, well, so you could connect if you had a volume pedal that had a tuner out, like an Ernie Ball passive one, you could use the tuner out on that and it wouldn't make any difference because the impedance is isolated from the expression loop. So you know, like the, the, the boost only has a single expression out that's TRS. Right. So you could either use an insert cable, which is like a Y cable. So it's TRS on one side and then two monos. You oh. can put that into the input and output of your Ernie ball and you oh. can put the tuner out of the Ernie ball and it wouldn't be a problem. It wouldn't, right. it, it wouldn't be an issue in terms of the impedance. I see. Um, but like with a boss expression pedal, you can do it. 
you couldn't do it because there's no tuner out on it. Yeah. There's no, there's no parallel output, but anything that had a parallel, uh, um, you know, output off of the, 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 the volume pedal would work. So yeah, E 500 would work. The Ernie ball would work, you know, any, any of the, the volume pedals that we typically think of would all work. Even the, the one that you have with the, with the, um, the A3 one that would still work. You probably just yeah. wouldn't want to use the boost on top of the boost, right? Um, but you could. Well, I've been known to <laughs> boost on top of boost on top of boost. Yeah. And then, you know, recently I broke out this pedal, this diamond pedal. Which one? It's called the Boost EQ. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which was always part of my um, rig for a long time. Um, they have a mid-range knob and when you like at 12 o'clock, I think it's it's not affecting it, but if you dip it a little bit to the left, like for the clean strat kind of sound, right. it, it rolls off. I mean, I never thought about it before, but it, it rolls off some mids in a really nice way. Um, and then there's something about those diamond boosts that have like a thing to them, you know? So for years it was part of my thing, and then the switch went went wonky, and I couldn't trust it. And so I put it up in my closet, and then I don't know a couple of months ago I got it down again. I'm like, damn, this does sound good. And so I kind of leave it on all the time, so I'm not stepping on the switch. It, the switch isn't broken totally, but you, it well, doesn't. We'll fix it when you come next well, time. <laughs> I need you, man. I need you. And and the other pedal that's like that too is the Hartman Flanger. Oh no, those are so which good. I love, but like literally, you'll turn it on, no sound. You'll kick it, you get some sound. All right, yeah, I'll, 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 I I I fixed a lot of those. Unfortunately, like Theo is has is kind of like when he got out of the business, it was like a clean cut. And even though he still lives, I, I think he still lives in the area because um, he, he, he's from Oakland. Like I remember being in a first year college student and he had just started Hartman pedals out of his house. Like I went down into his basement, you know, and like, it, really? Yeah. I think he at that time. Really like, is good. Oh, it's excellent. I mean, it's it's one of the closest uh, electric mistresses you can get. There's another guy in Poland that you need to check out that has an exact copy of it that's really? smaller and it's called the Roxanne flanger and oh, yeah and the company is called long amp hmm. yeah well, the hartman works great it's funny because like um but he won't fix six anything. months ago or what's that but he won't fix anything anymore it's part of like his deal is like his clean cut is that he's he's detached you know himself. really it's, it's literally like, just it's literally just the on off switch yeah I can almost see it going, you know, you step on it, no sound, step on it again, sound, you know, one of those things. It's yeah. like, I don't know if it has to be cleaned or because it wasn't stepped on and off of like millions of times at all, yeah. you know? Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, I had to do a, a track of the song Barracuda for um, like Hart wanted to own it. So like they could use it for commercials and stuff. Right. So I, I took on the task of re-recording Barracuda and I'm not in the business of doing sound alikes usually, right? <laughs> it was kind of a challenge that I took, but I auditioned all my flangers and that heart. And I read an interview with, with uh, Roger Fisher where he said um, he, what he used on that record was this, do it, it, it was like a, a kit and I remember vaguely, like in the back of Guitar Player magazine, there was an ad. It was some company out of New York, like Systech or something like that, that you could like buy the kit to make this. It was like a rack flanger. Yeah. And and when they were doing that tune, that was what he had, you know. And he said, all I remember was that it was on the slowest, slowest setting, right? So that helped me a really lot, you know. Yeah. But I got my ADA out, which I still have, like the one from the '80s, and um, you know, an MXR. I, you know, I have a few of them, and that that won the vote, man. I mean, that came really. I had it like on the slowest, you know. Shit, I must have sat and played that intro for about an hour because I had to get it right with the drums. Uh, they have those um, individual tracks on YouTube. Yeah. 
So the engineer that put the session together for me got like Ann's vocal on a separate track and the drums on a separate track. It's a brilliant track when you hear the tracks by themselves. I thought like so. the intro, that figure starts out slower than the rest of the, you know, like the BPM that it goes to. Yeah. And, and, and they obviously didn't cut to a click because it, it moves around. It's, it's a very steady track, but it moves around. You notice it when you're recording it. So um, anyway, but the Hartman won the, won the challenge big time. Yeah, they, they're, they're great. And I think that they're, they're sort of been immortalized now, but yeah, if you want, if you ever want to try another one that's small, uh, smaller, it's not tiny, yeah. but yeah, that Polish one, the long amp um, are really good. Wow. Yeah, they're cool. Um, yeah, that's cool. That you got to re-record that though. Did you use your Marshall amp on that or what? No. Um, also, it was a really good, we just Googled it or something, but this interview with him was really good. Um, he used a Strat. So I got like a Strat Strat, a Fender Strat that I have that have, uh, I think it has like the exotic single coil pickups in it or something, right. but it was just perfect for the sound. And um, damn, I, I forgot. I, oh, I used the Synergy thing. I yeah. used like the 800 module. Nice. And um, yeah, and messed with it until, and then I, um, like uh greg lease is that no not greg lease the, the other guy um, hey, the the what was his name uh howard lease howard lease yeah. he's on my facebook i should have known um it, it, he had a telly with a big speed right uh -huh. so i have this gretch um uh sparkle jet or something yeah. the solid body one that you know has a big speed and and uh so for the other side, so one side was the Strat, the other side was the Gretsch. And I, man, I nailed that sucker. I went through the tune. It was a piece of work getting all those parts and stuff, but it really, really sounds good. That was a brilliant track, but you know. Yeah, it was a brilliant track. Still still withstood the te test of time. Yeah. Still, still making heart money these days. Yeah, so I don't know what they'll end up doing with it, but um but it was cool having those broken down tracks, the, uh, you know, isolated tracks. Yeah. Especially for Anne's voice. Yeah. I mean, the whole time I'm working on the tune, I'm hearing her lead vocal from it. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if the, I wonder if those uh, tracks are, are in my hard drive of, of multi-tracks. Maybe they're right on YouTube. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rums, I said, I said, I said you know are, did, that, you, did you listen to any of those multi-tracks I sent you yesterday? Yeah. Pretty cool. Was that was that the part you played on uh, on the they don't really care about us the Michael Jackson one? Yes. Okay. And some, you know, like the thing about Michael Jackson, you, you know, talk about spare no expense. He spent so much money and he recut songs and he had like all these studios. It was, I mean, I enjoyed it because I was getting triple scale and being flown to New York and and my whole rig and stuff like that. But it was just like the days of just excess on the budgets, you know? And um, this guy, this French guy wrote a Michael Jackson book and was trying to get like input from people who actually worked with Michael Jackson. And so he, he found me and he had a couple of the other guys that actually played on this stuff, but then he had like this engineer guy, the second engineer, it wasn't Bill Botrell or anything. It was, a, you know, a guy that ended up working on a bunch of his things and like this guy he thinks he played on that they don't care about us because at, at an earlier like he was a guitar player <laughs> and and i'm sure he was on an earlier version but like right at the 11th hour like after i had done earth song i got home from new york and i walked in the door literally 15 minutes later michael jackson's people called me and wondered whether i could fly back to New York right away with all my gear and so, to do to do that song to do they don't care about us right so as flattered as I was and stuff I was hoping that didn't happen then it turned out oh we can send the tapes out and I ended up doing it with this guy Michael Boddicker and um I spent six hours on 
on that breakdown in the middle of that song. And we slowed the tape down to half speed because, you know, I don't tread like that. Very few people did. It had to be clean and it was written out. Yeah. And, um, and it was a very, uh, but at half speed, it was totally doable. So I had a rock sound up and we took it. Yeah, was it like a JCM 800 or what was that? Four bars at a time. Yeah, I mean, I was using, uh, I've always kind of tended to have a Marshall, but it might've been, no, it might've been the Eggnator. I mean, that was my, the IE4, that was my thing, that into the power amp. It was probably that, in yeah. fact. But um, so I spent all that time on that thing and then they mix the album and I hear that break and I can tell it's my guitars. Yeah. And so I'm reading this Michael Jackson book and this guy's going, and I was so glad that I made the cut, you know, and <laughs> I mean, cause he had done it months earlier or yeah. something and yeah. not to, not to take anything away from him. And, and then on earth song, was that mostly acoustic because the track no, it's actually until you sent me the isolated track, it's funny. It's like hearing your tracks, it's almost like hearing your baby crying, you know it's yours kind of thing. <laughs> I had totally forgotten that I played acoustic guitar on that tune. I think that's the first thing I, you know, that, da, 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 bland, da, da, you know, um, but I can tell that's my acoustic sound unless I'm totally crazy. And then the thing you really hear on that are the, uh, whatever those little, you know, uh, whatever those little licks are, the, yeah. the blues licks in the middle. And then on the out, there's power chords, which you can hear pretty good. I actually, um, that guy, um, Guy Pratt. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a bass player on that. One of the first things I said is, who is that on bass? Because he had that octaver thing yeah. on his bass. Yeah. And just an incredible bass sound. And he's been doing these, uh, these COVID um, uh, things on YouTube, like tracks he played on. Yeah, kind of like- So he did a break thing. Thing. He did a breakdown and I commented on his thing that, that like the first thing I wanted to know was who was that bass player and he was saying cheers man or whatever but um yeah so there's there's power chords and there's stuff you know and and uh that was fun what about the change the world one that I sent you because you were doing all were you doing the electric guitars in there yeah I mean the the because they're, they're, the, big, they're the, like, the big thing on that that you hear is that that chord oh. yeah what is it's like the f the f sharp yeah yeah, yeah. and then the, i don't think i mean that mix it says instrumental mix but i know there's i don't know what stage that was taken from yeah and there's some other things that weren't you weren't hearing on there yeah well there's another track i didn't send you which is like a scratch vocal of clapton doing like a scratch vocal and you can hear him like i don't know if he was still smoking cigarettes at that point but you can hear him like sound like he's taking a drag and then coughing and then like cutting back in like part way through the the singing take wow <laughs> i mean that's the thing about that tune was there was a really good demo that um uh, the guys, that one, right? um what's Not his name tom uh kennedy gordon kennedy and um tommy sims mm -hmm. uh nashville songwriter great great players tommy sims is phenomenal um so this demo, I remember coming into the studio and hearing their demo, which is what we were copying, you know, yeah. uh, and usually Babyface would, you know, he'd come up with his own arrangement or something, but it was like, this thing is so great. Their demo sounded like a really cool record, you know, yeah. that was another one of those songs. It's just like you heard it the first time and you go, this is different, you know, this is cool. And so I, when I played on the track, Dean Parks had come in the night before because because Kenny hadn't learned it yet. Mm -hmm. And um, and he, you know, he played it and he played it correctly and he played it right and stuff. But but I, I believe Kenny ended up redoing it. And that track you sent me sounds like him on, on acoustic. But I remember I, I even did a wacky thing. Like I had my dobro and I didn't do it slide, but I played like a picked, like a yeah. -in, -in, some kind of part like that, that was, you could barely hear it, but it was on the record. Kenny's on guitar, Baby uh, Clapton's on, you know, a couple of guitars. Um, and then I got to play it, you know, like on that thing with Clapton. And um, 
ended up playing that song so much. It was one of those things where like, I wanted to go back and redo my guitar because it was yeah. like, were you, you know, that, that thing of coming into a session and hearing a song and like, you know, the guys that, that had careers doing it were very good at coming up with parts. And um, you sort of go with your first in instincts, you know? That song has some trickier changes. So it was kind of like, it's not yeah. just, you don't just close your eyes and play a part. You know, you had to kind of feel your way around and stuff. But I was happy when the record came out that that, that one chord, yeah, you I mean, could hear it. Yeah, and it, is, it, it is a little tricky though. That half diminished is what I noticed like when I was playing in, in like wedding bands and stuff like that. Yeah. People screw up that half yeah, diminished right. part. Yeah. Yeah, and that. It's tricky. Yeah. I mean, we, we rehearsed it all those days and every day I'd realize that I didn't know another, you know, I would add something else that I thought I knew yeah. on the song and I didn't. Yeah, that was one of those songs. Yeah, it was, it's fantastic. This it's definitely with, was to the test of time. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Is it, cause it broke with that uh, John Travolta movie, you know, where he was like a, a clever right. or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big song. Yeah. yeah. Big song for sure. Yeah. Man, this... I told you I was going to try and make this short. Yeah, here we are two hours later. But that Oh, was... my God. <laughs> I guess you got to do a part one and a part two or something. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's, you know, this 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 format. I mean, we had a pretty steady view viewership throughout, you know, in terms of the in terms of the numbers. So I think that people are are interested they want to hear about it and uh i'm i'm just really grateful that you were willing to spend this much time and kind of dissect the tones and the approach and total yeah. pleasure you yeah. get me going and then you can't shut me up <laughs> well uh on my to-do list uh, i i will have to to get you a a, a nile compressor tomorrow <laughs> and so you'll you'll you'll, you'll have it uh, it's it'll just be shipping from the warehouse in van nuys so it'll probably be there on monday fantastic yeah so um man michael that was that was incredible i really appreciate all your time and uh and yeah just just give giving us everything the the uh the behind the uh behind the curtain view and and uh yeah, yeah. well i hope that if some of your viewers find it interesting i i always loved any info i could get on that yeah. kind of stuff and there was too little of it back when i was coming up yeah and, yeah, there, there definitely is. I, and, you know, I think that, uh, you know, somebody needs to make a replica of the Hitmaker Strat, you know. I think, you know, uh, Tarek, you know, Tarek. Yeah, yeah. He, he had Tyler build one and to, to every spec he could, he could try to copy on that thing. And we A-B'd it back when, and it was really close. I mean, it had the preamp, it had the Fralins, right. it had the Alder, it had the Maple Neck. Um, wasn't quite the same. And that that's what showed me that like, wow, this particular guitar has a little bit of mojo. Yeah, well, I think I think every every good guitar sort of has that. And even if you play 50 of the exact same model guitar, you know, like when, when I bought this uh, Rory Gallagher Strat. Wow. I, I played like 12 of them. You know, really? Yeah, because I had gone to to Sweetwater and then Chicago Music Exchange, like back to back. So I did like a a clinic um, thing or, or with with, it, with all the salesmen at Chicago Music Exchange, and then I had gone to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to do training at Sweetwater and 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 videos and stuff like that. And then I was flying back out of Chicago, so I played this guitar in Chicago, and then I went to Fort Wayne, Indiana. They had like twelve Roy Gallagher Strats at Sweetwater, so I played those. <laughs> And wow. there's one I wrote down the serial number, the best one. And then I went back to Chicago Music Exchange to play this one again because I was like, I think I wanted Chicago Music Exchange was better. This one really? was the best one. Yeah. And even though they're all the same guitar, like this one just had more mojo than the other ones. Wow. Whatever well, one. that's for sure. Yeah. That's why it's always been a real sort of not risky thing, but like when you can't just take it down off the wall and try it then and there and you're ordering it custom, it's kind of a crapshoot. Yeah. Even though with a good builder, it's going to be a good guitar, probably. But 
Well, I know James, the wood, you know? Yeah, Tyler is like that, though. I mean, I've heard stories about how he just will burn like, you know, just garbage cans full of wood that didn't meet. Like he'll build a guitar and it's not right. And then he'll just throw it away. You know, really? He, yeah. So I've heard I've, I mean, I've witnessed it, but I've heard that he's very discerning about that. But I'll tell you the ones that I've been really impressed by. I've, of course, played some of his guitars and they're great. But the Japanese versions are like incredible deals for what they really? are. You know, they're like half the price of a normal Tyler guitar and like all wow. and finished. So. If I, yeah. I end up getting another super strat, I think it might be one of those Japanese Tylers. Yeah. I mean, with the with the stuff that's out now, you really I was telling you about these fluence pickups. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff now where you can put together the things you like, you know, the 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 ingredients, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was this was really cool. I, I'm so glad that we got to go through all this stuff. And I mean, we always talk about it at Gilbert's anyway. This is just yeah. like three Gilbert's in a row, you know. Yeah. Well, next time we'll, you know, we'll, you know, maybe we'll have to do an abbreviated version. I'll have a hazmat suit. And, and yeah, you know, I know. I know. This is, we'll this is our version Gilbert's. of Gilbert's now, minus yeah. the Mexican food. Yeah. We'll puree the Gilbert's and we'll each have our straws. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Wow. Cheese enchilada milkshake. Uh, <laughs> well michael I, I i am uh i'm so grateful again and thank you and um, i look forward to speaking with you soon and I'll, I'll catch up with you offline on on getting you the the compressor and, and all that stuff fantastic well thank right. you man i enjoyed it all right good night all right bye